Hey, everybody. How you doing? Sarah, what's going on, Sarah? What's going on? It's going to be a hit and run, Sarah? Just kidding, Sarah. No, no. Hey, Tony, look at that. ZZ. Tony, I may see you in August. Don't give away your location. I may be there in August, bro. I may see you, okay? Okay, man? It's okay, man. Tony, it's my cousin, man. It's my homie, man. Tony, if you're a regular, I'm going to have to make you a, a mod. La la, care of it. You know what I'm saying, man? We're waiting for the guests. I sent them the link at the last minute. So, Soldier of St. Michael, how are you? It's been a while. I haven't seen you. Hope. Keep on hoping, brother. Ignacio Paridas. Tell us the eye. 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 There's a way to say it in Greek. Abdul Masih. I'll see you soon, God willing. But don't tell nobody where. Okay? Okay? I'll send you a message, man. Even though you got my phone, Abdul Masih, you got my phone. You decide to contact me on Facebook, man. What's up, Mercy? I can't wait. We got another session later, God willing, if the Lord Jesus wills, with William Albrecht going after Stephen Sissy on the Marian Doctrines. And then I might have to do a late night time, late nighter. What time is it there, Ortho Christos? Okay, man? He's in the background, Lloyd. Yeah. I'm wearing it, Sarah, so just to remind me, you got to stay... Lean by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of our God to give me discipline, self-control, to stay healthy and fit, keep the weight off. This is a medium. So I wear it just to remind me not to outgrow it. Please, my Father. Please, Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Holy Spirit. All right. Well, guess what, Wayne? Right? I may do a late night one. So it may be 10 a.m. for you. I'm going to do part four, God willing, Lord willing, part four, my response to young Don stillborn on the Trinity. Okay, right? Let's get the cat needs attention. All right, now my friend Lloyd is in the background. What's up, Lloyd? You ready, man? You ready, Lloyd? What's up, man? I pretend I have muscles that I don't have. <laughs> Sorry, that's right, man. You have a set of skills, though. All right. <laughs> Hello, Sam. How are you doing? I survive, brother. Survive. You know, when you're an old man, I'm going to be 51 by yourself. You survive. But it's good to have you, brother. Yeah, good to be back. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's Friday evening here in Warsaw, and uh, yeah, well, uh, well, look at look yeah. here. I want you to see how they how they troll. I want you to watch this troll. I, I you know I attract a lot of trolls that don't like me like that man here. We have a topic: just a girl who like YouTube can't even spell right. Instead of saying just a girl who likes YouTube, can we ask questions? <laughs> this is a troll, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I always invite questions. That's always been my my practice on my channel, at least. And okay, hello, we, Abdel Masi. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here again tonight. We, we welcome questions, but the question she has is not going to be about the topic. I just went to her YouTube channel. says, I love God. So hopefully she's a Christian, but I promise you it's not going to be about the topic. They can't yeah. wait for me to do a Q&A. You just when I open up to any topic, but you just mentioned yeah. Unitarianism, and oddly, when I mentioned recently about the the Protestant movement with their involvement with the Muslims, with with the aspect of collaboration, um, out of that, out of the Protestant movement arose um, Unitarianism, which was accepted as a legitimate, quote unquote, Christian religion, um, and. So, so this is an outgrowth from it. It was tolerated due to the new culture of religious tolerance. You got it. And then you've got a lot of crazy offshoots. So basically, it's like it starts with, we just want to get married. Now it's, you're a bigot for not letting us, for not letting us uh, sodomize your three-year-old. Yeah. You know, so it started with, well, you know, we just want to have some different ideas. And then it's like, oh yeah, those those Christians are evil because they believe in the Trinity. Yeah, and Sorry. just to confirm, and I know we're going to go into the meat of the matter. It's very sensitive. It's going to disgust you. You're going to hate Islam even more, hate Muhammad even more for what they do to children. You will find Unitarians and Muslims <clears throat> inviting one another on their platforms and butting up because they have one thing in common: they hate the Trinity. And you'll find Unitarians on Muslim channels bashing Trinitarians to the glee and delight of Muslims. You'll find that often. Yeah, I'm sure that's a subject we'll be getting into. Because if you look at what happened in the Protestant movement, you've also got pre-Unitarianism, pre, 
pre the French Revolution, pre the atheist movement, you've got these very same quote unquote Christian groups who are professing exactly the same things like free love, which was like the hippie movement. But this this came out of the Unitarian movement and and the Protestant movement. Then you had um, basically socialism coming straight out of the Protestant movement, expressed very much within that within that milieu. But yeah, that's a discussion we'll have another day. And um, because, look, as everyone knows, I'm not a Catholic. I've said this openly. I've been an Anglican my whole life, but I question what the Anglican Church is doing. I am very much against it. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm also I'm thinking, well, the every time I see a polemic against the Catholic Church and I go have a look, it's usually 99% just propaganda or just openly a lie. And I started thinking, okay, well, then, Let's go have a look at the polemics coming out. Of, you know, let's, let's examine the polemics. Let's go look at the history of the Protestant church. And let's just say it's a little dirty down there. Hmm. Tell me about it. The Lord willing, in future weeks, as God puts in your heart, we'll get into those subjects in depth because I know you're doing some extensive research in the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther. So God willing, when you feel confident to share that material, we can do it here on this channel. And you said yep. this one in particular only takes one session. Yeah, I think this will be one session. So this is just, uh, right. we did discuss this. And I think just to introduce people to a little bit of the Sharia. Yeah, let me, let me see. Do you have your slides ready? We're ready to begin. Guys, it's one session, God willing. If you need to do a second one, that's fine. But it's going to be disgusting. It's going to trouble you. It's going to offend you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to break your heart for Muslim women and Muslim children. And you're going to hate Muhammad even more because you can't hate him enough. If Satan became man, he'd become Muhammad. Watch what you're going to hear. It's very graphic. So viewer discretion, be advised, be advised. It's going to offend you. Yeah. Get okay. Well, so tell you what, let's just jump into this. And it's a dirty topic. Yes. I'll try and hopefully we can lighten it a little bit. But uh, let's just go. Okay. I'll start with this. People have routinely been asking me about Islam and magic, Islam and occultism. Yeah. Uh, this is a topic I will be addressing. It's, man, it's a lot of research. You know, people need to realize how many hours go into this, how many evenings and weekends I have to, I have to give for this work. So this one is about Islam, Sufis, the Nazis, and the curious case of Baron Rudolf von Sobotenburg. So we'll have to start here because this idea of magic and occultism. Now, uh, Sam, I have been talking about some of these topics and I've noticed there's a, there's a channel, there's a couple of channels now suddenly recently talking about Sufism, trying to paint it in a very positive light. Oh. And I suspect that this is due to reaction to the work that I'm doing, which is starting to show Sufism to be, to be deeply occult, deeply satanic, to be sort of, shall we say the upper echelon of, of the Islamic um, let's see the 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 senior the, the the senior people within Islam, the top echelon of its of its controllers or its you know its main scholars, and how satanic they are, and then also how they are connected to movements like the Nazis, how they're connected to the Freemasons, how they're connected to the KKK and things like that. And um, so you've got these movements trying to shall I say try to well you know these people are just trying to find love and trying to express their best selves, and the fact is. They're forgetting, just overlooking small things like how these people were extremely involved in the scientific racism movement, involved with the Nazis, and so on, and involved with groups like the KKK, involved with the Freemasons. And we need to look at the dark, the very evil side of this. And I will be diving into this. So if you like Nazis, Turkish Sufis, if you want to look at the, um, the young Turks, the Armenian genocide, and um, let's just say, you know, about these guys here, you know, Mr. Little Mustache and uh, Muslims. Yeah, this is going to be a fun ride. Speaking of which, have you heard of that YouTube channel called The Young Turks? <clears throat> yes, yes. Jank Uger, who's Chunk a yogurt. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, fat boy Chunk, who's a militant atheist. So, you do you think he deliberately chose that name to insult? Who's he deliberately uh, chose that name? And in fact, yeah, yeah, he deliberately chose that name. Yeah, and let's just say the young Turks, so there's a link to between Baron von Sobotendorf, the Sufi, the Turkish Sufi, yeah. and the young Turks as well. Yeah, because what's sad, he's got an Armenian co-host. She's a, she's a Armenian, and she works with him. And I know. not knowing, well, she does know, not, not you know, not knowing how, offensive, yeah. how offensive the young Turks moniker is, because 
Over one million Armenian, Greek, Assyrian, Chaldeans were slaughtered in the Armenian, Greek, Assyrian, Chaldean genocide. But shame on her. May God repay them for their evil. But go ahead, brother. Yeah. I mean, the Turks also destroyed a thousand churches along the Armenian border. They're known for having destroyed a thousand churches. Okay, so, so these are things that we're going to be talking about. And of course, people should be aware, this guy is the second prophet in Islam, Hermes Trismegistus. Islam yeah. claims him as a prophet, right? And this guy is one of the major founders of, shall we say, the, the New Age movement, the, um, theos the theosophy, you know, Madame Blavatsky and all of those things. So, yeah, so this is something that, that Islam needs to, besides, he's also the, the, the Egyptian god Thoth. He's the Greek god Hermes. He's Idris. He's Hermes Trismegistus. He's the Roman Mercury. It, it just this story is so laughable. You know, I'm laughing. Why? You, because my dad's name was Hermes. So now I know why he was so pagan. Just kidding. But my dad's name was Hermes. <laughs> yeah. but, also, notice. Remember, we've got the god. You know, the you know, we've had Baphomet, the goat head yeah. god, the, the yeah. androgynous goat head god with the boobies and the you know yeah. and the masculine parts as well. And he's got one arm up and one arm down. Look here, the guy's got one arm up, one arm down. See, yeah. the same satanic symbolism. Exactly, but yeah, yeah. Those, are, those are things we will get into. Okay. Uh, those are definitely things we will get into. Okay, let's start here. So in Islam, I <clears throat> uh, just wanted to mention for those who don't know, um, when our knowledge about something is unclear, as Muslims, we say Allah knows best. Just as Christianity has its creeds, like the Nicene Creed, Islam has its creed. And of course, this actually, these words come out of the creed. When we don't know, we say Allah knows best. So this is Allah actually Allah. something. Sorry? Arabic, it's Allahu Alam. Yeah. So, yeah, and they're supposed to avoid deviation, differences, and divisions. We follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, except that's a Daif Hadith. So we can't follow that, except this is their part of their basic creed. They have to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and the congregation of the Muslims. Now, when they say congregation, they mean it's leadership. This actually refers to the scholars who make that decision on behalf of the Muslims. And we avoid deviation, differences, and divisions. So they're all of one mind, in other words. That's what they claim, right? And I'm going to be using a handful of sources. So one of the titles, I have, I did drop this in the chat earlier. I will drop this back in the chat again. I will drop a link to this. This is Studies in, in Islamic Law and Society. This is from Brill, right? Minor Marriage in Early Islamic Law, which is interesting. So let's have a quick look at this. This is not the main focus of my talk tonight, but I want to bring this up. This is a Brill document. <laughs> Right, so this is very highly academic. This is, yep. shall we say, rigorously authenticated. Okay, no punishments or legal consequences are stipulated for the early marriages. Thus, it remains a common practice in rural areas of Egypt to marry off girls at the age of 13 and delay registration of the marriage until 16, creating serious legitimacy issues for any offspring born in the interim. This is modern day Egypt. In Syrian refugee camps in Jordan, and I have been there, I've been to those. Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon, and Turkey, where there's no recourse to any sort of state authority, there have been dramatic increases in child marriages since 2011. Mm. Okay. Wives received the full range of financial maintenance in exchange for providing sex. Hold on. That doesn't sound like the sacrament of marriage. No. I give you money. You give me sex. This it's sounds small. like prostitution. Husbands may restrict the movements of their wives in order to fully benefit from their sexual availability. That's right. I've right. actually yeah. said that, uh, Lloyd, not to cut you off, you're going to confirm it. I've said people that the, the dowry, the mahar that they pay is to purchase the woman's private part for pleasure. That's what they're doing. That's part of yeah. the Islamic idea. But go ahead. Now we'll talk about this. Yeah. So, Although the Encyclopedia of Women and Islamic Cultures asserts that the marriage age in Yemen is 14, taken from child marriages in Arab states, elsewhere, Yemen has been grouped with Saudi Arabia as not yet having determined a minimum age for marriage. Right? We'll be looking at that. That reminds me I need to find a reference, but that's fine. I'll get that later. Saudi Arabia has famously abstained from adopting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights citing Article 16's description of marriage rights as one of the principal reasons. So they object to Western human rights. They don't like the whole idea of marriage rights. They have to, because they're going to go against the Sunnah of Muhammad if they adopt Western Correct. age restrictions. They can't do that. They have to follow Muhammad. Right. And so, so this is a Brill book. Now, understand this is academic, so they try not to offend anyone. They're just trying to be very wishy-washy in a way, but fine. We'll have a look at what this says. 
The Sharia does not define a girl's marriage age, he writes. This is Al Fawzan, okay, a very famous scholar in Saudi. And it is not up to those who want to impose one to legislate anything for which Allah did not grant permission. In other words, the Sharia, there is no minimum age for marriage in Islam. Infants are, are good to go. Infants. Infant is defined as a baby in the cradle in the Sharia. Right? So babies in the cradle, good to go. Off you go. Have fun. Right? And it is not right to legislate against Allah. Doing so, he warns, will lead to communal destruction and untold suffering. So if you forbid the marriage of minors, you will lead to the destruction of the community. Sam, that's a little odd, isn't that? Yeah. And see, you just confirmed what I said. You cannot legislate, folks. And he's going to give you detailed documentation, documentation, primary Islamic sources. Muslims cannot legislate against Sharia. Since Allah put no limit on the age of a, of a young girl, you can't unless you are rebellious. Yep. And interesting, someone just mentioned, I don't know that that Muslim, that slob, Daniel Hakikachu, actually had a debate trying to justify child minor yes. marriages. Yes, correct. In his 2011 fatwa, he defends the lack of an established marriage age in Islam by adducing no less than four claims of the ijma. The ijma is the Islamic consensus, the consensus of the four scholars who founded the four primary schools of fiqh, or the only technically schools of fiqh, which would be Hanafi, Maliki, um, Shafi, and Hanbali. Right? So he claims that the ijma is the final story here. He doesn't go to the Quran, he doesn't go to the Hadith, because the ijma is the final assessment of all of these previous sources. And he speaks of the illicit, the legal nature of marrying off prepubescence. Okay? And he refers to the al muqni Now, of course, if you go to uh, Ibn Fibbin, oh. right, he, he references the al muqni as a very primary, very important source of Islamic law. Okay. A father may contract marriage for his mature or prepubescent virgin daughter against her will, as long as she has made for her, as he has made for her a suitable match. Hey, that'll be a good husband for you. He's going to give us money. So off you go, you four-year-old girl, you. Yep. And I want to emphasize that, Lloyd. Against her will. Did you hear it? Against her will. Pay attention. This is a Muslim source. Against her will. Let that sink in, Westerners and Christians. Sink in. Oh. This is Islam. You know, someone asked me, Lloyd, have you heard of Jade Daev? So what do you think of him? Um, you know, I hate people asking me questions because oh, I'm going to I'm going to give them an answer. <laughs> yeah, I blocked so, him already. Just the trolls know. No, 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 it's okay. It's just that I tend to I just tend to say what I think. Uh, I've tried to listen to Jade Dyer. I just find I wish he would get to the point. It's like, you know, he just it's like, please get to the point. What are you trying to tell me? I've been here 15 minutes and you haven't said anything yet. It frustrates me. Okay, there is no difference of opinion over the father's ability to compile the prepubescent virgin. Ibn Qadama then cites the consensus claim of Ibn al-Mundir, accompanying this claim is the caveat that the match must be suitable. So there is no difference. In other words, the ijma is, is complete. All the scholars agree over the father's ability to compile the prepubescent virgin to get married. Right. So there's, there is compulsion in this religion on that issue for sure. Then they go on to talk about prepubescent marriage is legal because of Quran 65.4, and we will be discussing that. This verse proves that the prepubescent female can be married and divorced without consideration of her opinion. He then cites the report of Aisha's early marriage, noting that it is agreed upon and that Aisha at the time of her marriage being six at the time of the contract and nine at the time of consummation had no opinion to give. Your thoughts, Sam, before I go on. There's just a yeah. short of the sum will do, and then I will... Uh... No, I, I want people to understand, Muhammad set the precedence. You see what they're basing this on? Chapter 65, verse 4, which we've discussed, and he'll discuss, but 65, verse 4, was actually modeled by Muhammad. If Muhammad is the standard of morality and an example for Muslims to emulate, and he contracted marriage with a prepubescent, premature minor at 6, and then had sex with her, modern at 9, who the hell are you, Muslims, to legislate against that? That's what they're saying. So keep that in mind. Muhammad, this cancer, this filth, who is now burning in hell under the feet of Jesus Christ, may the Lord Jesus erase his name from the earth and erase his book, and Muslims wake up to this filth. So go ahead, brother. Yeah. Obviously, Muslims will try to say, look, if you stand in your head, spin around three times, and squint yeah. a whole lot, you'll find that Isha was actually 19. And I, I exactly. would just say to them, where are the Sahih Hadith 
to claim that she was 19. Please, please bring me a list. I'll be happy to read them. Okay, so he speaks of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. He states clearly that a virgin should not be given in marriage without her express permission. Okay, so Hanbal says she must give her permission. And then Hanbal refused to speak about whether or not her marriage would stand if she did not consent. So in other words, he says, okay, well, you know, you shouldn't do this without her permission. But if she's married anyway, he refuses to comment as to whether that's a valid marriage. In fact, he does not repudiate that. So he lets it go. He was asked if a man could marry off his virgin daughter without consulting her. And Hanbal conceded that it was possible, but he preferred that she be consulted. He preferred. But... It's going to happen anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. So no, not exactly, shall we say, taking a stand there on something. Okay. Divorce can occur after consummation. Divorce can only occur after consummation, which clearly reveals that he believes that prepubescence can engage in sexual intercourse. Or in the language of the jurists, of the language of the Islamic lawyers, have it performed upon them. So sex is performed upon the minor. Yep. Yep. Your thoughts, Sam, before I continue. I'll just I'll just want to throw this out. So and before I go into the Sharia directly. Yeah, I want I want the people with children. Some of you have children, you have young girls. Some of your daughters are 12. That's actually considered pretty much old. Because as you're reading. You can marry off girls at any age now. And I'm sure he's going to confirm this. There's only one condition. It's not the age. It's if they can handle penetration. So until they can, you need to be yeah. gentle. With them. And he's going to. No, confirm and that's, that's an entirely like, subjective judgment as to whether they're ready. That's an entirely subjective judgment. So you with children, daughters, I have too. May the Lord Jesus protect these children. Now, remember, you are Christians and you have daughters. You'll protect them. Thank Jesus. These children are in Christian homes with healthy Christian parents. We, that's what we pray because we got some sick deviants. But imagine being a young girl living in a Muslim society. Every young child in a Muslim society is in danger, and we need to cry out to the Lord to do something about it. So go ahead, brother. Yeah. In fact, it states here, I mean, these are not marriages that exist merely on paper. In other words, these are not marriages that exist merely on paper. And they speak here of, you know, contracting such a marriage over a son or daughter's objections. Minors were presumed too young to have any opinion. So, yeah, just, just deal with it, right? They speak here, finally, with regards to divorce, it is noted that, blah, blah, a female can be divorced against her will, just as she can be married against her will. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, yeah, that's that's... Islam, man, this is the hikama. So praise be to Allah, Sam. Yeah, man. This hikama. Bit of hell. Muhammad is Satan, man. But anyway. Scholarly consensus is clear that prepubescent girls may be married off. Not only this, but they can be married off against their will. Therefore, no minimum marriage age for little girls can be determined. Exactly. And I think one of the last ones here. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat. <clears throat> so... Writing on prepubescent marriages was originally concerned with both genders. So Islamic, Islamic jurisprudence on prepubescent marriage originally focused on both genders, but it evolved into almost exclusively to discuss females. We will have a look at the little boy stuff as well. A little sure. bit. Okay. We will yeah. have a look at that. So I think, I think, okay, this one, this probably wraps it up here. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole book. So this is just, I think this is just illustrative enough. Oh, there's a few more. What is clear is that for the prepubescent virgin female, whose opinion is considered to be no opinion, right? whose opinion is considered no opinion, and whose right. voice is quite literally considered to be no voice, the full weight of 1,400 years of patriarchal authority can be brought to bear by simply saying they have agreed. Whereas the introduction to one consensus, the Ijma manual states, remember the Ijma is the major source of authority within Islam, not the Quran, not the Sunnah, the Ijma is the primary source of authority within Islam. It is, the, it is the agreement of all the scholars on the points of law that are derived from the exegesis of the Quran, the Sunnah, the Tafsir, and all of these. It's the coalescence, the, the merging of all of these opinions into a consensus. Right? And 
As one Ijma manual states, or Fiqh manual states, anyone deciding an issue contrary to a prior consensus of the companions and the scholars of the garrison cities is a deviant sinner. So to go against the Ijma, you are a deviant sinner. So in other words, to say, look, child marriage is wrong, that makes you in Islam a sinner and a deviant. Because we're going to be looking at the Ijma once I get through all of this nonsense. Let's have a quick look at a couple of other things here. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> um, when I tackle the Enlightenment, we will be talking about, you know, everyone talks about, you know, we need to go back to the glory of Rome and the glory of ancient Greece, to these wonderful, wonderful philosophers who, who had rationality and who brought great morals, because Christianity didn't do that, you know. No! You see, because what happens, you notice, <clears throat> okay, numerous studies have detailed that prepubescent marriages of Roman girls and their early consummation was common. So there's been this push to claim that Roman marriages took places took place for girls above the age of 18. The, the simple fact is that that's a lie. That's been oh. trying to whitewash history. Roman marriages of prepubescent girls and the early consummation was the norm. The Greek Plutarch, and of course, this was the most commonly cited philosopher in the Enlightenment, Plutarch. Plutarch was basically, shall we say, a, an early communist, right? Let's leave it at that for now. And he assumed that the cultural phenomenon of child marriage to line the Roman desire for an unformed character and an untouched body. In other words, they wanted innocence. So this is something that the Romans practiced. And of course, uh, if you are an Enlightenment philosopher and atheist wanting to go back to the glories of Rome and Roman philosophy and Greek philosophy, well, this comes with that. You know, we're supposed to think these people were awesome. So it was, yeah, so this, this happened. So Christianity put an end to that. Yep. But not the belabor point. But aren't we saying that in the sense that because of the rise of secularism and humanism, now we're yes. seeing gender confusion, gender uh, fluidity, and yes. even a push for Mamba. Mamba is an organization where men are trying to legally sanction pedophilia. Yep. So going and all those things. Yep. sex with yep young children. So aren't we seeing yep. this? Confirm that what you're comes saying. exactly. So. Understand, Christianity is the departure from this kind of filth. Yep. So prepubescent marriage was quite common in Roman society, and it remained so for quite some time. Okay, so I think I'll end this one here. Then, okay, so now I'm going to go over to something else in Islam, just so that we can, one, annoy people, two, um, give you something to, uh, well, annoy Muslims, really, um, apologists. So Stephen O'Mara and Will Roscoe, this is called the Islamic homosexualities. Yep. Okay. And, oh, that's a good-looking boy right there. Okay. Okay. So, culture, history, and literature. And Islamic homosexualities. And look, guys, um, yeah, if you've got kids, you might want to send them out of the room. Yes, okay? yes, yes. There's going to be some graphic images drawn by Muslims. Let's just say, yeah, I'm not going to go into detail on the book itself, but I'm just going to – you guys are welcome to download it off my archive. This is this, this this is Islamic. You'll notice this is Islamic text. I I don't have to. Oh, man. This is Muslim. Okay. Goodness, what Muslims are doing, man. This is this a Muslim is, drawing, by the way. Emphasize that this is a Muslim who drew this. This is Muslim art. Okay, yep. discussing Muslim practices. Oh okay. my god, dude. So uh, so look, yeah. Sam did kind of warn you. This is this is this stuff has bothered me so badly. I need to share my pain with everyone else. Yeah. Ah, okay. yep. Yeah. Right now, let's get those beautiful yes. pictures, those brain-stabbing images out of our heads. Yep. So, with boys too. Yes, with boys too. Understand, Islam. Let's just say. Islam, we've discussed before, does not have a moral system. It is not a moral system. It is a system of laws. It is a legal system. There is no right and wrong. There is legal and there is illegal. That's right. And there are loopholes within the law that can make any illegal act legal. Understand that there is no fundamental concept of right and wrong. There is no absolute wrong. It is a, it is a, what's the word? What's the word for, for morality that is fluid? Um, Sam? Um, it's subjective. It's, it's um, what do they call it? Relative. Relative, like my relatives we're all related no, i'm just kidding nothing to do with islam yeah so now let's have a look at this unfortunately i didn't have time to highlight this so i changed my browser and i wasn't able to highlight this but let's have a look through some of these so this is a fatwa on islam qa the world's largest islamic advice site okay 
This site gets between a minimum of 150 million to 400 million visits a month, right? So this is like a, technically a quarter of the Islamic population visits this site every month. This is fatwa number double two, double four, two. Okay, this is from 2002. So this is 21st century, right? This is not the 1200s. This is not the 900s. This is the 21st century, right? And it says, why Islam allowed to marry children, girls, below the age of 10 without their permission? So this guy is asking this question. Why are you allowed to marry girls without their permission? Okay. So he's asking this, and this is the real fatwa. So he asks, okay. So he says here, so the scholar tells him in this fatwa answer, marrying a young girl before she reaches the age of adolescence is permitted in the Sharia. Indeed, it was narrated that there was scholarly consensus on this point. Okay, marrying before adolescence. Now people are going to say, well, you know, that they can get married, but it doesn't mean that you, that you, that you diddle them. Well, maybe yeah, well, we'll right. find out. We're going to find out. Okay, and notice that they actually bring up Quran 65 for as the justification. And for those who have no courses, okay, i.e. they are still immature. Notice, in this fatwa, they tell us that women who are immature are the ones who have no courses. In other words, they are prepubescent. Peter Philia was shunned upon in ancient Greece, the laws against it. Yeah, I look, we're going to have to look at, but in Rome, definitely. But look, is that true? I don't know about ancient Greece. I mean, I've heard stories, so we'll, we'll have to look. Yeah, but I don't that, mean to distract you by putting it up. I'm just leaving it up because Orthochristos, <clears throat> he's well read as well. And he's completely in agreement with you. He loves your work. Just to let you know. Okay. So notice, Allah has made the idda in the case of divorce of a girl who does not have periods because she is young and does not have periods because she's young and has not yet reached puberty. So notice they're, they're telling us here, this is the world's largest Islamic advice site. They're telling us 65.4 refers to girls who are prepubescent. They are minors. In other words, she could be three years old, four years old, five years old, six years old. She's prepubescent. Three months. Allah has made this a valid marriage. Allah has made this a valid marriage. Okay. And they speak here of Aisha, she was six years old. They don't say she was 19 or 18. And he consummated when she was nine. Right? He consummated when she was nine. When she was nine. When she was six. Right? They confirm with Daif Bukhari. And Daif, you know what's funny, Sam? There's a, there's a woman who's been commenting on my videos. And she's like, you know, you are so, you are so ignorant. You don't realize you've just you refuted yourself because you are using... Da'if hadith. Da'if hadith cannot be relied upon. Da'if hadith are clearly not to be used. You're not to draw any conclusions from them because they are weak. Because I was joking in the video. I was saying Da'if Bukhari, Da'if Muslim. Uh, she took you seriously, yeah? <laughs> and, she, huh? and she's saying, you are using Da'if hadith. Man, she doesn't even know I'm making a joke. <laughs> this is so a Muslim. Good thing about it, Sorry? You're rocking her foundation. She's getting desperate to find a way to say this can't be true. So you just made her life hell and she's going to come to her senses. Glory to God. But she, she doesn't, doesn't she even know that Bukhari and Muslim are Sahi? No. No, from her reaction, what it was is she wasn't taught this. When she heard you say this, she went into shock, but then she's trying to cling to a glimmer of hope. But no, it's weak. When she finds out it's not, I guarantee you she's going to leave Islam by the grace of God. Yeah, let's hope so. So notice, okay, so they say here, the fact that it is permissible to marry a young girl does not mean that it is permissible to have intercourse with her. Okay, fine, we'll, we'll see about that. That's what they say, right? But let, let's continue. That should not be done until she is able for it. So hold on, now they're kind of talking out of both sides of their mouths, okay? The prophet delayed the consummation of his marriage to Aisha, but now are we? who basically was the final scholar, the, made the final major scholar within the Shafi school of jurisprudence. He said, with regard to the wedding part of a young married girl at the time of consummating the marriage, if the husband and the guardian agree that diddling her will not cause harm, then they, yeah. well, the husband can go ahead. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Hanbal said that once a girl reaches the age of nine, then the marriage may be consummated even without her 
upon sin. Let me emphasize what you mean by that. When they say consummated, meaning to have sex, to penetrate her, that's what they mean, by the way, the term consummate. Yes. And I want to emphasize what these sources are saying. If a girl is before nine, please listen, people, to these statements. If a girl is before nine, then the condition is if she can handle being penetrated. If she can't, then you have to wait till nine. And when she's nine, it doesn't matter whether she can handle or not. Nine, you can penetrate her because that's what Muhammad did to Aisha. He's the standard. Pay attention. This is what the sources are saying. And then they say, but Malik, Shafi, and Abu Hanifa said the marriage may be consummated when the girl is able for intercourse, which varies from one girl to another. So no age limit can be set. You need to understand this. There is no lower age limit for sex with little girls in Islam. There is no age limit. If she if she was born a month ago, she is good to go. Please understand this. Okay, this is Islam. You need to start showing this to Muslims. You need to talk about this. You need to make this public. You need to discuss this. You need to make them confront this. You need to start showing them their own sources. This is twenty. This is the twenty-first century. This is two thousand two. This is not the seventh century here. Okay. So there is nothing in the Hadith of Aisha to set an age limit or forbid that in the case of a girl who is able for it before the age of nine. So yeah, I'll just I'll just leave it here for the moment. I think that should be enough. Okay, there is nothing in the Hadith of Aisha to forbid diddling a girl who is ready for it, in your opinion, before the age of nine. So I'll, I think this is this is enough. I think we've made our point, Sam. Do you agree? Yeah. Let me let me tell them who you're quoting because you see it says Shah Muslim. This is from Islamic question and answer Q and A, but they're quoting Imam Nawawi who wrote a commentary in Sahih Muslim. So notice the source. It says, Shah Muslim, volume 9, 206. This is the opinion of one of the greatest Muslim scholars and the premier commentator on Sahih Muslim, citing what other Muslim scholars have stated. This is not someone's opinion. Pay attention. And this is an official Muslim website, Islam Q&A. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, so so guys, I think hopefully we've made our point. We've showed we've shown now these these other sources. One is Brill. Brill is possibly the oldest publishing house for academic literature in the world. I think they date back to the 17 or 1800s. They are really, really old. They are highly respected. Their works cost a small fortune. Okay. Honestly, their works cost a small fortune. Like I said, the the Encyclopedia of Islam will cost you five thousand dollars a year to rent, costs you forty thousand dollars to buy. Plus, you have to pay a maintenance fee every year for to get updates. It's it's insane. Okay, um, okay. So let, let's let's take that. So now we'll go to, I think let, let's go to before we go to any. Okay, by the way, afterwards, Sam, I'm going to give you a link. I'm going to drop this link. This link I'm going to drop in the chat quickly, so that everyone can download this. Right, so you can download this manual. Now, this is from a, um, I'll just get back to where I was. This is this is a document that I took from another website. It's from this video made by a, another South African. Um, <clears throat> I've had my disagreements with the way this guy deals with some issues in the past, but this video I liked. Um, it's very much detailed. He goes into all the earlier sources, as you can see here, that discuss child marriage, okay? Um, I prefer, to be quite honest, to stick to major public sources and to stick to the ijma, the, sh the sharia, the fiqh. I prefer to go to the final consensus, not all the other sources, because you can always you can always play, you can always beat around the bush on the other minor sources. But this document, I've given you the link. Um, oh no, no, sorry. The book that I just read from is this. I will I will I'll upload this link and I will send you this link, Sam, so you can, people can download all of this and see all of these resources for themselves. There's an overwhelming amount of resources on this topic that, that just Muslims are not going to be able to escape this one. Okay, let us jump into the Sharia. Okay, so the ijma means that they then avoid deviation, differences, and divisions. Remember, they said that someone who disagrees with child marriage is a deviant, he's a sinner. You are sinful if you disagree with what we've just discussed. Okay? Okay, now... 
So Islam is religion of law. It claims the Sharia is a corpus of law, right? Thus, two basic questions follow. What are its laws? Where are these laws written? Where are they to be found? Now, any comment before I continue, sir? No, okay. Oh, yeah. So let's look at Quran 65.4. And we're going to go to the Pakistani court system as it is today and Islamic law. So people are going to want to tell you, Muslim apologists will want to tell you that, well, this is Islamic law from the ninth century, you know, and like we've evolved since then. And I'm going to say maybe, maybe not so much, right? So this is a paper that I'll show you. Okay. On the basis of the exploratory analysis of the reported cases, the following Islamic law books, the following Sharia books are found to be relied upon more frequently by the courts in Pakistan to derive an authentic point of Islamic law on a particular issue. The first one is the Hedayah, translated by Charles Hamilton. We will be looking at the Hedayah today. And the Digest of Muhammadan Law by Neil Bailey. Right? He then mentions Muhammadan Law by Said Amir Ali. Now, I like these two because these are older, much more, much older, much more traditional manuals. These are translations of manuals that go back centuries. Right? And the principles of Muhammadan Law, these are more modern discussions, but these two... These two are prime. So we're going to look at both of these today. Okay, usually I just do number two because it's easier for me, but <clears throat> we're going to have a look at both today just to be thorough. Now, this is from a paper called Genealogical Analysis of Islamic Law Books Relied On in the Courts of Pakistan, written by two professors of Islamic law. The one is Shahbaz Ahmed Chima, professor, PhD at the University of the Punjab, and Samir Ozer Khan, assistant professor, Law College, University of the Punjab. Okay. And this is the Digest of Muhammadan Law. This is an English translation of an old um, fiqh book, okay? Subject to which is, okay, British Courts of Justice in India. Because the Brits, the Muslims wanted to use Islamic law in their court system, so the Brits obliged by translating this so that the judges could utilize Islamic law, okay? And let's have a look. So, Sam, do you want to read this for us? This fourth, the highlighted section? <clears throat> Fourth, fourth, when a man has had sexual intercourse with a girl under the age of nine years, pay attention, under nine years, and has ruptured the parts, it is unlawful for him to have further connection with her, but she is not released from her ties if connected with him by marriage or slavery. Let me repeat that again. It is unlawful for him to have further connection with her but she is not released from her ties if connected with him by marriage or slavery. If no rupture has taken place, the prohibition is not incurred according to the most valid opinion. So, Sam, does that say under nine years? Exactly. And has ruptured the parts. What do you think this refers to? Uh, it's talking about rupturing the eardrum. Um. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's certainly creative, but uh, no, sadly, <laughs> it is not talking about a rupture of the eardrum. Yes. Remember, we discussed briefly, the we discussed previously, that when you think the girl is ready, you can go do the deed. Well, you are 38 years old, you are 40 years old, your wife, your wife is three, maybe she's five, maybe she's two and a half, I don't know. And you did the deed and you have torn her open. You have ripped open her. You've torn this open. Okay. She, you are no longer allowed to have further sexual relations with her, but she remains married to you. And if she is your slave, of course, you don't have to marry her first. So in other words, this is the eternal law of Allah, which refers to women who are either yours by marriage or by slavery, and you can use them for this act. Islam produces, and this, Muhammad Faridi, yes. Sadly, sadly, this, yes. And if, if you do not destroy her vagina this way, if you do not rupture her vagina, then there is no prohibition, and you go on and you help yourself. So, okay. By the Any way, if I want yeah? to, yeah, I, want, I would like to connect you with Muhammad Faridi as a YouTube channel and a ministry. He's a former Shia, who was a militant Shia, who gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've had him on my channel. He's more than welcome to come back. He shared his testimony. But he's got a YouTube channel and a ministry. And Muhammad Faridi, I want you to connect with this brother. 
bring him on your channel. He's got some amazing stuff. He'll be a blessing to you as you'll be a blessing to him. So exchange information. Just wanted to make thank sure. You know, I know the name. I've watched many of your shows, but thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Mohammed, for, for commenting. So let's continue. Uh, let's continue. Now, this is the Reliance of the Traveler. This is the most common Islamic law manual in the world. It's called the Reliance of the Traveler and the Tools of the Worshipper. It's a single volume encyclopedia, shall we say almost. It's the single volume compendium of Islamic law from all four schools. There's generally a Shafi book, but it utilizes the most sound opinions from all four schools and contrast. There's nothing like this in the Islamic world. This particular book has a little bit of everything. It's fantastic. There's nothing like it where, where this thing gives you a little, little taste of everything. And of course, once this book was translated, it caused, let's just say, this has been the most, the biggest gift to me and the biggest gift to us for understanding Islamic law. This book is fantastic for that purpose. It is the most popular, the most sold, the most common Islamic law manual in the world. It is used, it is designed to be used by scholars. It is designed to be used for lay people. But the fact is it's meant for lay people. Now, what is also fantastic is that Muslims say, well, Lloyd, prove to me that this is the single most popular Islamic law book in the world, that it's the most used. And I'll say like, well, if it's not, which one is? Then I'll, we'll go use that because that's got authority, right? So please tell me. Not a single Muslim has yet answered my question about, well, if I'm using the wrong book, which one should be used and has the right information? So I'm still waiting for that answer to come in. So let's have a look. A woman's postmarital waiting period, the idda. So let's read Quran 65 for us. For your women who have despaired of further menstruating, if you're in doubt, their waiting period shall be three months. And those who have not menstruated yet, well, three months, right? So there is no waiting period for a woman divorced before having had sexual intercourse with her husband. That's section N9.1. So there's no waiting period for a woman divorced before having had sex with her husband. Great. Then it says a waiting period is oblig... Sam, could you read that for me, please? Why not? Just read that. <laughs> There is no waiting period for a woman divorced before having had sexual intercourse with her husband. A waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse. That's what the idda is. Whether the husband and wife are prepubescent. Okay, let me emphasize that. It doesn't matter if they are prepubescent. They can already have sex. A girl could have sex as a prepubescent minor, and if she's divorced, then she can be married off again. Whether the husband and wife are prepubescent, have reached puberty, or one has, and the other has not, intercourse means copulation. If the husband was alone with her, but did not copulate with her, then and then divorced her, there is no waiting period. Let me emphasize, the idda is only a waiting period if you've had sex with the woman and divorced her. If you haven't had sex, there is no waiting period, and that's from chapter 33, verse 49 of the Quran. So this assumes a minor, a premature minor, has been violated sexually. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So understand, this is talking about after intercourse, whether the, whether the husband and wife are prepubescent or not, or one is and one is not. So in theory, this could be, you could have a prepubescent child, a boy, and an, and an adolescent and, an, and a post adolescent woman, right? A mature woman, a, a, an actual grown woman. And in fact, within the Islamic language, you don't call children a boy child a man, and you do not call a girl a woman. This is not part of the Islamic language, right? But suddenly, when it comes to this topic, you know, well, a six year old can be a woman, you know, because because in the heat, they, they mature faster. It's like, yeah, potatoes bake quicker if you fry them in hotter fire, right? Whatever. I didn't realize we were like little potatoes wrapped in foil, but anyway. So understand this is discussing prepubescent sex, and they mean copulation. In other words, you've you've you know you've you've done the deed, okay? This is copulation defined in section N7.7. .7. Let's continue. When a woman has been made love to, okay, and she performs the purificatory bath and the male sperm leaves her vagina, then she must repeat the purification, the hustle, if two conditions exist, okay? So she's had sex with him, the sperm has left her vagina, and if she, if two conditions exist, she must repeat the, she must bathe twice, in other words. That one, that she is not a child. If she's not a child, then she must bath twice. She must purify twice, okay? If she is a child, well, she only has to do it once. 
You see? So once his sperm leaves the vagina, then, then it's okay. Oh. He has to do it once. But rather, old enough to have sexual gratification. And they notice here that a child that young is not old enough to understand what's happening and to have sexual gratification. This is purely about the man's sexual gratification. I want yes, the ladies to see this. Ladies, did you hear it? Here's an Islamic manual, a manual in Islamic jurisprudence. One of the leading sources in Islam. Don't let them lie to you. Sunni sources. And it's talking about sperm in a young girl's vagina. Are you catching it? I, please, may the Holy Spirit penetrate your hearts and minds to hate this man, Muhammad, hate this religion and pray for its annihilation because there are Muslim children who are being sodomized and raped because of this religion. What book would describe sperm in a young girl's vagina? Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They say here a full indemnity is paid for injuries which paralyze these members. Like this, now they're speaking of very injurious crimes, okay? For which you, these are torts. These are called torts. They are damages for which require restitution. Or for injuring the peritoneal wall between the vagina and the rectum. That will be the anal cavity for those who don't know what the rectum is, okay? So they become one aperture. In other words, if the male adult has his little infant child, that he has sex with, and he tears her open so that the vagina skin rips down to the anus and fecal matter starts dripping out of her bowels into the vagina and gives her <clears throat> a fistula or fistula, which is a lifelong condition. It's very, very toxic. Then, well, you know, she must be paid for injuries. In other words, if he's married to her, she remains married to him but he can't have sex with him anymore because you're considered unclean because now you have fecal matter mixing with your blood and mixing with your private parts so this makes you this makes you very shall we say unclean in islam and they consider this as just one of these things that happens in islam now this is just considered normal because it's in the law it's disgusting this is islam this is islam and muslims need to answer for this you need to confront them with this uh, your thoughts, Sam, before I go on? Because we'll see more of this. Yeah, I, I want people, and I'm seeing the reactions, and I praise Jesus Christ, our Lord, that you are sensitive to the Holy Spirit to see what a filthy, disgusting, heartbreaking <clears throat> statements that this Islamic religion would go into detail talking about whether you ruptured a young girl's rectum because she's too young to handle penetration and you've <clears throat> penetrated her too forcefully to even damage her rectum. <sighs> Thank the Lord Jesus. Our children are born into Christian homes. They're in the West. But don't be so selfish in that your heart should break and you should be crying with tears for these Muslim young girls and boys who are being sodomized in Muslim countries. It's happening right now. This is not theoretical. Please. Don't think he's just reading book. This is not theory. They're doing it right now in Muslim lands. So when I first came across this, it's hard to explain, Sam, but I, I believe, look, I believed every story I've been told because I didn't know any better, right? So I start, I learn this stuff. I discover this. I start reading. And the first time I read this, I can't explain to you the shock, the, the shock, the horror that I sat here crying. Okay, the very first time, like three or four years ago when I came across this stuff, or a few years ago. I can't explain to you the horror. The, the, I sat here with tears in my eyes, I, and I was angry. It's like, like you, just, you just have this, 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 you know, you've got this anger, but, but who do you express it to? Where do you express it? How do you, I mean, it's like, you're just like, this is wrong, right? And I, I had to speak out about this. Okay, infant rapists. Yes, no, we're going to get to the infant rape very shortly, sadly. So now this is from a book called The Heavenly Ornaments by Hishti Zevar. Another great guy to talk about this is Adam Seeker. This guy, Adam is brilliant. I mean, the guy's knowledge is just fantastic. He's one so, of my mods and I bring him on often. So, Yeah, Adam is fantastic. He knows, myself and Adam, when we talk, I mean, man, it's like he just fills in all the blanks. Everything that I don't know, he just fills in the blanks. It's like, like man, it's just crazy how good he is. So Heavenly Ornaments by Hishti Zeva, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Right? This is fiqh, okay, to educate women. Okay? It's also known as the Jewels of Paradise or the Heavenly Ornaments. Okay? A favorite with the people of the Indian subcontinent as well as the 
Indian Muslim diaspora all over the world. That's in Wikipedia. But this is true. This book is very famous. In fact, in India and Pakistan and, and places in that region, a woman will get given this book as a wedding gift or prior to the wedding so that she can learn how to be a good wife, okay? A good Muslim wife. It's a comprehensive handbook of the fiqh, right? The sharia, basically. Islamic rituals and morals. Islamic morals. And it says here, let's, let's have a look in this book. If a person has Wait, sexual... Before you finish it, before, let me emphasize. So this is the gift you give to a woman when she's about to get married. Yeah. It's a book this on... Is, so this is the wedding gift? Hey, honey, here you go. Read. Yeah, yeah. You buy this for her so she can learn to be a good Muslim wife. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead, man. If a person has sexual intercourse with a minor girl, ghusl or the... the the, um, what's the word, the purificatory bath will not be obligatory on her. See, so when you have sex with a minor, she's not obliged to bath, which we saw that we had the similar discussion in the previous book. But in order to get her into the habit, she should be made to bath. If you have sex with a minor girl, she should be made to bath to get used to it. Because once she's old enough, you know, she has to do it twice anyway. Sexual, sexual intercourse with a minor girl. This is read by millions of Muslims. Right? If a woman is underage, but not so small that if one has intercourse with her, there is a fear of the vaginal tissues tearing to such an extent that the vagina and anus will become one or will virtually come together, then by the insertion of the head of the penis into her vagina, ghusl will become fard or obligatory on the man if if he has reached the age of puberty. However, if there is the aforementioned fear in a very minor goal, now they categorize her as not just underage, but very minor, then mere insertion of the penis does not render purification obligatory. Sam, am I reading this wrong? Maybe, I, maybe, it, maybe the Muslims, where are the Muslims to, 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 to come and discuss this with us? I wish you were. Now, brethren, do me a favor. Take his session. I give you a link to his YouTube channel. You need to subscribe to his channel. Support this brother prayer free financially. Make these sessions go viral. I've had other sessions on pedophilia with Adam Seeker. Ladies, are you reading this? You don't need to rush through this material. If you need to do a part two, I'd rather you do slow so they can sink in. Ladies, are you reading this? Listen to this. Mothers, listen. Did you see it says if a man is <clears throat> penetrating and it's so forceful that he tears the vagina so that the vagina and anus actually collapse into each other. Are you, are you reading that? This is an Islamic source. This is what Muslims are talking about. This is what Muslims are writing about. This is what's occupying Muslim minds. If one has intercourse with her, there's fear of the vaginal tissue tearing to such an extent that the vagina and anus will virtually come together. This is what Islam is talking about, writing about, thinking about. And this is happening in the Muslim world right now. An adult this wrote this, an educated scholar of Islam, a trained priest, if you want to will. Look, Islam does not have priests. It has lawyers. It doesn't have morals. It has laws. It doesn't have right and wrong. It has legal and illegal. Understand but a trained, educated, highly educated imam with at least five years of training wrote this. A man sat down and wrote this, and this is legal. This is lawful. This is their version of what we would consider moral. Understand, this is Islam. There is no getting away from this. Please. You, you guys have my permission to take all my stuff and translate them. You don't need to ask me. My material is yours. Free, but don't charge people, translate them, clip them. It's yours. Disseminate it all over the world. Go ahead. So understand, obviously, because the Western world has frowned upon this, this is generally not so obvious, not so in our faces in the West. But don't think it doesn't happen and don't think it is going to come back. It is going to come back. If they establish the Sharia, this is the law. Now, I'm not saying every Muslim male will do this, but he is allowed to. This is the law. It is legal. So this is this is the PDF, the PDF files paradise okay let's continue if a person whose testicles have been cut off okay fascinating not a, that's another brain stabbing image if a person whose testicles have been cut off inserts his penis into the back part of anyone 
into the back part of anyone. Into the back part of anyone or the vagina of a woman. Sam, I was under the impression that that kind of thing is the death penalty in Islam. Why are they not discussing it in the context of the death penalty? <clears throat> so what he just showed you, that image, Islamic homosexualities, is actual documented sources. And Adam Seeker has been on my channel, and he's confirmed this. Brethren, you will not believe how prevalent sodomy is in Muslim countries. Young boys are frequently sodomized by grown men. Why? Let me explain. Whereas a young girl <clears throat> isn't allowed to free mix. A young girl can't free mix without a mahram, a guardian. Young boys are allowed to free mix with grown men. So what the grown men do, they look at the young boys because they're beardless. They look effeminate. They then prey on them and sodomize them and rape them. So this is why it's saying here, look. If a person's penis touches the back part of anyone because they know it's so prevalent in Muslim societies, they can't stop it that there are grown men penetrating young boys in the anus like the picture he showed you. So if you do that, then you got to do. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh... Um, someone said, um, uh, you said, there's the joy of, hold on. Uh, so, someone made a very good comment that um, he said, Islamic holiness is the joy of demons. That's Mo Abe. Islamic holiness is the joy of demons. And that's a very good comment. And Muhammad Faridi asked me, Lloyd, are these documents, PowerPoint, available anywhere? Um, Muhammad, I will share the all of the documents with you. I will share the links to all of the documents with you. I will send this um, this particular set of slides to Sam and to yourself for the PowerPoints. In fact, I will share these with you and make sure you have them available. Yeah, Muhammad Faridi, contact him. He'll do you one better. He'll come on your channel, discuss these same topics for your channel. So if you want to share your, your, he's got a Facebook. I'll give you the link. And he's got a YouTube channel. So Mohamed Faridi, he'll do you one better. He's available to come to your channel and discuss the same topic. So you can have it on your channel as well. Yeah. Okay. So just email me. Um, Sam, you can maybe just send him an email with my email details or something. Or I'll, I'll contact him from his website, from his YouTube so if a person whose testicles have been cut off inserts his penis into the back part of anyone or the vagina of a woman, purification will be obligatory on both of them if both are mature, if both are mature. In other words, if they are not mature, then purification is not obligatory. Alternatively, it will be obligatory on the one who is mature. So now they are speaking of having, yes, um, let's just say going through the sewer, or vaginal sex with a woman, and they're speaking of one of the parties, or both parties may be immature, right? So now this is simply just corroborating the previous statements. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's continue. This is the Bahishti Zaver, okay? This book is an encyclopedia of Islam dealing in a very simple way with the tenets and principles to practice in day-to-day -day life. So that's this is the uh, Bahishti Zaver. Right? This is what we're talking about, the heavenly ornaments. Yes, heavenly ornaments indeed. Right, let's talk about what if your infant wife proves to be adulterous? What if your infant wife, infant is defined in Islam, in the Sharia, as a, as a, as a child in the cradle. So what if your wife cheats on you? Sam, have you worried about this as a, as a, as a real problem? Brother, you're preaching to the choir. That happened to me. So, but anyway. I'm talking about, no, your infant wife, Sam. Your okay, infant I'm sorry, wife. I read the first part because I was reading through it. A husband accused his wife of adultery is discipline. Yeah, no. So your infant wife. Has anyone, has any one of the audience, have you ever had uh, reason I, to be concerned that your infant wife might have cheated on you with another man? This is why I have, that's probably why I had a meltdown. How in the world, how the hell... Can an infant cheat on you? Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> yeah, let's have a look. So, section N eleven point two, a husband who accuses his wife of adultery is disciplined, called tazir, right? So, if if a husband accuses his wife falsely of adultery, he is disciplined, especially when adultery is impossible, such as when the person accused is a mere infant. Okay. 
So in other words, you have looked at her when she was copulating and seen the adulterous penis in her vagina, but such as when the person accused is a mere infant. So if you accuse your infant wife of cheating on you with another man, of actually having sex with another man, this is wrong because the, the law goes on to state basically that an infant could not have initiated the act. She would have been too young. So this, she would have had, she could not be responsible. She cannot be held responsible because clearly she was too young to take the action to cheat on you. So yeah, praise be to Allah for this, right? Yeah. So Sam, your thoughts on this? So Islam even envisions a possible scenario of an infant wife cheating on her husband and tells you what the punishments are in case, because Islam is comprehensive. See, Lloyd, this is why you're a kafir, you're an unbeliever. Islam is so beautiful, it even imagines every possible situation to prepare you in case it becomes a reality. What's wrong with you, dude? You are jealous. You wish Christianity was this in depth. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, I'm sure this is very difficult for the audience. Not many people are going to want to watch this. This is very uncomfortable. I can tell you, I find this sickening. sickening. I, I found this incredibly disturbing when I discovered this. I wanted to rage and shout and cry because it was very difficult for me to read this and think an adult wrote this. Right. Let's continue. We're talking about stoning, adultery, and virginity. So if the offender is someone with the ability to remain a virgin, right, then he or she is stoned to death, right? So this is, and this is defined in section 012.6. We look at section 012.2. This is the book of justice, okay? Someone with the capacity to remain chaste or virginal, meaning anyone who has had sexual intercourse at least once with their spouse in a valid marriage, blah, blah, blah. A person is not considered to have the capacity to remain a virgin if he or she is prepubescent at the time of marital intercourse. So you are not considered to have the capacity to remain a virgin if you are prepubescent. In other words, it wasn't your decision. You were forced into it because you were prepubescent. You had no say. This is, by Western standards, this is rape. Sam, thank you for your thoughts. Absolutely. But remember, the Western legislation is kafir. It's of shaitan. Sharia is from Allah. And Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. Didn't you say that earlier? Yep. What's wrong with you? So this is Allah's law. This is Muhammad's law. This is the law that Muhammad brought. This is what Muslims, remember, it is illegal. It is illegal for Muslims to discuss this with, with this with you. It is considered treason. They will face punishment up to and including death for discussing this with you. They can be made unalive for revealing this to you because this is something that is a weakness. This knowledge would be considered a weakness in Islam. It reveals their, 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 their weaknesses. It reveals their, their inner secrets. Put it that way. Remember, it is sacred law, but it is also secret law. Right, let's continue. Ah, this, this might just be interesting. I just thought I would, <laughs> this just as a point here. At the first indication of disobedience to marital authority, a wife should be exhorted by a husband without his immediately breaking off relations with her. When she manifests a disobedience by an act which, though isolated, leaves no doubt as to her intentions, he should repeat his exhortations and confine her to her room, but without, but without striking her. He, although he may have recourse to blows, he might beat her even where disobedience, disobedience is manifested by an isolated act. So notice how in this, within the Sharia, this is Minhaj at Taliban, okay, page 318, there's a link. So your wife can be disobedient only once. It says, look, look, she has to do it several times before you take action. But if she really upsets you and she's just not, she, she's wrong once, then you can, you can have recourse to blows. In other words, use these. Only where there are repeated acts of disobedience, may you inflict corporal chastisement. This means using a whip or a stick. But, you know, so I just thought I would throw this in there just to say this is what Islam thinks of women. I've been told that the Hadith say <laughs> you use a miswak, you know, the miswak where they use the clean tea and just lightly tap. What do you mean, blows? What no, you no, talking? you take the look, you know, <laughs> you take the toothbrush, you sharpen it, yeah. you sharpen it, and you stab her with it. That's what they mean. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's what they mean. You stab her with it. I'm sorry, what, what, what is this? 
It's not heavy enough to beat her with. You need to hurt her with it. That's what it says here. Corporal chastisement. And resort to blows. Mm. Yeah, I just thought I'd throw this. So I think, okay, so that finishes that section. <clears throat> and then I will go to another source. Okay. Now I need to go to another source. And I need to go to... So let me bring up another source here. By the way, Lloyd, as you bring up that source, you met mm -hmm. Bert Richardson, certified JKD instructor by Dan and Asanto, who's Bruce Lee's student. You have a special set of skills, sir. You know, Bert so again, Richardson. who said that? What, what about Burton? You, you've met Bert Richardson. I'm saying I've met him, yeah. Yeah, he is, uh, for people who don't know, he's a student of Danny Nasanto, who's certified by Bruce Lee and Jeet Kune Do. Yeah, I did a private training for Danny Nasanto. I, I trained him privately for a couple Dude, of Dude, you have connection with Bruce Lee. I like you more now. Yeah, but that's a long story for another day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to go to the Hedaya, okay? Uh, let me just go here. This is the Hedaya. This is the, this book, or this, 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 compendium this corpus is 2652 pages more or less this is the hadaya the commentary on the muslim laws now how this works is generally speaking you'll have a scholar like shafi will come along a hanbali or malik or whatever they will write a, a law book right fairly small not not very comprehensive then someone will come along and write a commentary the commentary exegetes expands upon the original Islamic law text. So the, the foundation is laid by the major scholar, the mujtahid mutlaq, like Shafi or Hanbali or Hanafi or Malik. Then you have the commentary. The commentary is detailed. The commentary goes into all of these permutations, right? So therefore, so Shafi's original book is like 150 pages. This is over two and a half thousand pages. And then someone will write a summary after that. So you usually, so you have the original text, the commentary, the summary. That's that's typical for the way Islamic jurisprudence works. Okay, the Hadaya is considered the most complete, the most complex. Although, I mean, I guess, well, okay, from the sources I'm looking at, the Hadaya tends to be the final book. If you go to seminary, if you go to an Islamic seminary, law school, and you train to become an imam for three years, five years, seven years, whatever detail, level of detail you go into, the Hadaya is the final book that you learn. So you start off with some basic ones, and then this is the final book it's considered the most complete, the most complex. Okay, And we are going to look at the Hedaya because it is the most detailed, the most complete. So let's have a look here. So we're going to look at Nikal, the Book of Marriage, Book 2 in Hedaya, Volume 1. Okay, We're going to look at the Hedaya, Volume 1. Uh, this is in my, uh, my Google archive. Okay, And I'm going to, you will find it by looking for Hedaya. Okay. Uh, you may find something if you look under heat dia, but look under head dia, and we are looking right now at volume one. Right? Bear that in mind, dia volume one. Okay, the book of nikah or marriage. Nikah in its primitive sense means carnal conjunction. Notice it doesn't mean the sacrament of marriage. It means. It means, so Sam, can I use the word the f word here? It means fucking. Okay, please understand that carnal conjunction. It is not about the sacrament of marriage. Christianity, we have the sacrament of marriage. This is just having sex. Did you say the F word? <gasps> Go ahead. Yeah, you can. Yeah, look, I mean, I wasn't trying to be gratuitous. I mean, I'm trying to explain and... that, that we've seen in the other sources as well. That's all it means. So okay? you're saying that Mo Muhammad was a mother fudger. <laughs> Good. Because look, we can go into we can go into marriage in the reliance, and it'll say that if a man has the desire for sex, then he should get married. Not if a man wants to fall in love and have a fa If the man is horny and he's got a bad case of blue balls, which is basically what the Sharia says, then go find a woman so you can get off. That That's quite bluntly what it says in the Sharia. I mean, when this that's not this discussion today, but but really when you read it, that's that's what it's saying. Okay, it is. this is something completely different to how we view marriage. It's a contract used for the purpose of legalizing generation, legalizing yeah, legalizing having kids. Okay, but sure, but it's got other other factors at play as well. Okay, this is yeah. Okay, now notice <clears throat> it says here, okay, it's an op so it operates as the principle to a right, okay, of a right to carnal conjunction in virtue of a right, as in the case of a female slave, 
Okay, so you have the right, as in the right, if you have a female slave, you can have sex with her. But if you want to have children and so on, blah, 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 let's say it's a carnal conjunction. So now the word F-U-C-K, okay, uh, please excuse me here. I'm, I'm, I spoke with a lawyer once and I don't know if this is true. Okay, so this this Indian word from us coolie kids, okay, apparently it comes from, uh, it comes, apparently I was told, I could be wrong, it comes from a legal term for unlawful carnal knowledge. It was oh. a legal term for rape. Now, this is what a lawyer told me. Whether it's true or not, I, I don't know. But they told me this came from a legal term. In their law school, that what they learned was, instead of saying rape, they would say F-U-C-K. For, the term was for unlawful carnal knowledge. You unlawfully had carnal knowledge of a woman by forcing her, right? So this was rape. So in the, in the, in the 1800s in Britain or whatever, they didn't want to use the word rape. It was unpleasant. So they used the term for unlawful carnal knowledge, which sounded so much nicer. It was a euphemism for sure. rape. You're Sorry? telling me the word pock, because the, the Filipinos have our time saying F. So we'll say pock was meant to be a nice way of saying someone who's raped. And now puck has become a very nasty word. So basically it was simply shortened. So apparently these letters, F-U-C-K, was simply shortened in the law courts to, to that. Sorry, Sam, you're not sharing anymore. I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Okay. And so apparently it just got shortened to F-U-C-K, and that's where that word apparently comes from. That, that's what I was told. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. So now, now notice the right to carnal conjunction is also established by matrimony. Now notice they speak here of sale. So in other words, okay, the consignment operates as the principle of a right to carnal conjunction in the case of a female slave. So when you buy a slave, you can have sex with her, okay? But you also get the right through marriage. This is just to have sex. This is not about love. This is purely the right to have sex so they don't kill you for having sex. Marriage may be contracted by the use of the term bia or sale. Notice bia or sale. A marriage may be contracted by buying someone. I have sold myself into your hands. And this is approved because sale operates as the principle of a right in the person. You may sell a person. Now, in the Old Testament, okay, I believe it's in, in Deuteroscopy, it says that if you steal a man, you have committed a crime, and for that you are killed. You may not sell a man, right? Am I correct, Sam? Yep. Yep, it's even condemned in 1 Timothy 1.10 by Paul. He even condemns it. If you if you kidnap people, kidnappers, kidnap them for slavery, that's condemned by the law. Even First Timothy one ten says that. And someone says consignment, like like goods. Yes, it, it's got the connotation of a commercial transaction. Please understand, it's got the it's a commercial transaction. You may be sold into marriage. You may sell yourself into marriage. Okay. Now going on, it says here. I'm going to go through these notes. So, so evidence of infidels regarding Muslims is illegal. I'm just going to drop this here. So. Evidence given by non-Muslims, okay, that's you, the infidel, that's you, if you're not a Muslim, regarding Muslims is illegal. In other words, it is illegal for a non-Muslim to give evidence against a Muslim, and any such evidence is rejected. Therefore, if you give evidence against Muslims, right, the court must reject that. Anything we say is evidence against Muslims, that is illegal. It is illegal for us to testify, and I am now testifying against the Muslims. What I am doing is illegal. Okay. <clears throat> any any comments, Sam? Before I go on. So far, so good. People can see that you're unpacking the filth and trash <clears throat> of Islam because Islam <clears throat> is nothing but full of filth. Filth and Muhammad was a mother pocker. But go ahead, mother pocker. Go ahead. So, if a man desire another to contract his daughter, being an infant. Now, this book dates from about this translation dates to about 1793 approximately 1795, I believe. So, so this, this translation is well over, it's 230 years old. Um, the book itself, the laws themselves go back, obviously, well prior to, to that period, well, well prior to that date. These laws go back to the 10th, 11th century, right? But the book itself, this translation, you can see they're using the old English style here. If a man desires another to contract his daughter being an infant, so they do speak of infant marriage, in marriage to a third person, the marriage is lawful. Infant marriage is lawful. Infant is this defined as a baby in the cradle. Actually, maybe I should define that. Maybe I should go to the Reliance. <clears throat> Actually, let me just bring up the Reliance of the Traveler. 
Okay, let me just bring up the Reliance of the Traveler. And let's get to Cradle. Infant is defined as an infant in the cradle. Okay, understand. An infant is an infant in the cradle. Please understand that. Right, that's what they mean when they say infant. Child in the cradle. Okay, let me go back to the head dia. <clears throat> okay, so infant marriage is lawful. Right, so this has been established. This goes back a long way in history. Right, let me continue here. Okay, but if the father of the of the infant aforesaid should go away and be not actually present at the execution of the contract, the marriage would be null. So the father has to be present for the marriage to be apparently. Okay, but of course, but anyway, there's remember every single Islamic law. There is a there is a a caveat. There's a way around every single law. Okay. There is nothing in the Islamic law that cannot be circumvented or changed. Okay, so now it says here, a nikah matat, or usufructory marriage, where a man says to a woman, I will take the use of you for such a time, for so much is void. So according to the Islamic law, usufructory marriage, or the, um, shall we say, the temporary marriage, the mutta marriage, is apparently void, at least in Sunni Islam, in theory. Okay, I just wanted to mention that. All the companions appear to have agreed concerning its illegality. I know it still happens in, for instance, in the Philippines. I'm aware of friends who've been there and have witnessed it. Right, so it still happens, but uh, apparently this temporary marriage. A nikamawaket, or temporary marriage, where a man marries a woman under engagement of 10 days, for instance, is null. Okay, so apparently these, these things are null and void now within Islam. Let me see, what did I miss here? Okay. Ah, case of a double marriage by one contract. They speak of that, but let, let me go back to infant marriages. Okay. So Shafi accounts an adult virgin the same as an infant with respect to marriage. So an infant is considered the same as an adult virgin with respect to the matrimonial state. So, yeah. Now, he does say it is not lawful for a guardian to force into marriage an adult virgin against their consent. This is contrary to the doctrine of Shafi. This is contrary to the doctrine of Shafi. So, so Shafi says, well, your little infant who is in the cradle is of the same status as an adult virgin. Marry her off. Off she goes. She's married now. The married man can do with his wife as he pleases. Yeah, let, okay? let me find what he just read. Notice the section says it's not lawful for a guardian to force. Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah, I just want people to understand what you just read to them. It is not lawful for a guardian to force into marriage an adult virgin. Now, what this source is saying, Shafi, who has an Islamic school of jurisprudence named after him. There are four major Sunni schools of Islamic jurisprudence. Shafi is one of them. You have Hanbali, Hanafi, Maliki. Shafi says, right? No, you can force an adult virgin to marry against her will, and he even classifies infants in that category. That's what it's. That's what you're reading. Understand what the point is. There are some Muslims who said you cannot force an adult virgin to marry against her will. Shafi went against it, said no, you can, and then lumped infants into that category. So even an infant can be forced to, to be married because he considered her in the same category as an adult virgin. This is what you're reading. They're even talking about the legality of forcing infant girls to marry. I mean, you understand how sick this religion is? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know what I find odd is someone just mentioned in the comment, the Islamic takeover of Europe is God's way of punishing Europe for abandoning Christ. God has allowed the ancient enemy Islam to take them over. This guy is repeating Martin Luther. Now, one thing I'm really tired of is, is Protestants saying, well, you know, I just follow Jesus and I just follow the Bible and, and I don't follow a man. I don't follow a tradition of man. I Martin Luther is not my scholar. Now, the not my scholar argument is a very Islamic argument, which is used, unfortunately, by Protestants. But also, I just follow Jesus. I don't follow the traditions of man. Well, those are Luther's words too. Or you, you are repeating Luther basically verbatim, and you are doing what Luther made tradition. So you are following Luther, and then you're lying to me about not following Luther. That's something that really annoys me. 
And um, Luther had exactly the same sentiments. And Luther was a pig. And I'm being polite here. Luther was, was an absolutely horrendous, disgusting man. And Luther had some odd things to say about Islam that he as a Christian, supposedly as a Christian, should not have been saying. So, so yeah, um, just that I, because man, if there's one guy that annoys me, it is Martin Luther. Yeah, pigs uh, are cleaner than him, but the implication may be due to Martin Luther's rotten fruit and thinking he's restoring the church, he destroyed Europe. Because a lot of people don't know, and you know this, you've confirmed it because I'm sure you've studied it. Liberal Protestant scholarship, liberal scholarship arose from Protestantism. Did you know that? If you go to 18th yeah. century, 1700s, this critical liberal scholarship that destroyed the Bible came out of Protestantism. It's one of the fruits of Protestantism. And the hotbed of liberal scholarship was Germany, of all places, where Martin Luther reared his ugly head. So Luther was truly a tool of the devil. May the Lord save us from that. Yeah, look, one day, I mean, look, Luther is a very, it's a minefield going off to Luther. Let's just say that. Um, but there, there are ways and means to deal with that. And I'm busy working on it. If you go back to, if you ask yourself, where do Luther's ideas come from, right? Where do Luther's ideas come from? Then you go back to people who had the very same ideas. Luther just packaged these ideas very nicely. Luther simply made them into a, shall we say, a mature theology. And he packaged them and he gave them nice names. Okay. He marketed them really well. But Luther's ideas all come from people before him who were all heretics, who were all deviants, who were in some way or another just not exactly well upstairs. So, so that, that's where you got to go. And you start to find that Martin Luther, yeah, let's just say Martin Luther was not a Christian. I do not, I no longer believe Martin Luther was even a Christian. He was absolutely not. So, so no, he was he was promoting heresy bluntly. And, uh, but that's a story for another day. Let's finish this. Okay, so now the speaker, if they smile, okay, so now silence is consent. If, if the child smiles or remains silent, this is compliance. The prophet has said a virgin must be consulted in everything which regards herself. And if she be silent, it signifies assent. So according to, they're taking this hadith, they're turning this hadith into a law for all time. This is a permanent law, okay? If a man contracts a virgin in marriage to another without her knowledge, upon her receiving intelligence of it, the same tokens suffice. If she laughs or remains silent, she consents. So in other words, you can decide to sell your girl to another man and then tell her the next day. And if she laughs, she agrees with it. <laughs> If she thinks you're being ridiculous, that that says yeah, that she agreed to the marriage. Did you guys understand what he just read? When a mahram, the guardian of a girl, comes to her and asks, "This man has proposed. What do you say?" If a woman, if a girl says to remain silent, that means yes. If she laughs, that means yes. Do you guys understand? No, but this what means you've contracted her in marriage already. You've already made the agreement. This is without her knowing. This is not a proposal. You've already agreed to the contract. Yes, see that. Yep, this actually makes it even worse from the hadith of Muhammad. But are you catching that? You're seeing yes. it, right? So now, if it's sinking in, I don't want to keep cutting him off. I want him to get to the point. But I want this to be more than educational. If this is only educational, then you are <clears throat> missing the point. It has to convict your heart, break your heart with tears crying out to the true God, Jesus Christ, to move sovereignly in Muslim lands to save these children. And do your part to witness because there are young girls and boys who are being sodomized as we speak. Don't forget it. This is not academic. In India, in Pakistan, in the Middle East, in the Philippines, there are young girls and boys being sodomized because of Muhammad who's burning in hell. Glory to Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. Right. Infants be contracted by their guardians. So infants can be contracted into marriage. The marriage of a boy or girl under age by the authority of the father is lawful, whether the girl be a virgin or not. Now, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Infants can be contracted, but infants, okay? So the marriage of a boy or girl under age, and they refer here to infants, is lawful, whether the infant is a virgin or not. What you do you say to this? Sam? Do you guys understand? This is a, assuming a situation 
where they found an infant already being violated and sodomized. Do you guys understand that? Yeah. Do you understand? This is talking about situations that are not just theoretical, but situations that arose, and they now have to comment on it. So you have a situation in which an infant girl was found to have been penetrated. You understand how disgusting this is? Like this brother just said. By the way, glory to God for this brother's testimony. He was deceived into becoming Muslim. Now he came out and he's in love with Jesus Christ, on fire for Jesus Christ, and he's doing his part to destroy Islam. Yeah, Paulus, this is a non-virgin infant. You ask yourself, this is considered legal. This is disgust. Understand, this is the major, the major, as far as I know, Islamic law manual, right? That, that when you become an imam, this is the final one that you study because it's the most detailed of them. And they're discussing here. This is not an accident that this is in here. Let's continue. Let's just finish this off. Authorities vested in the father to contract his children during their minority. So he may contract them without their knowledge during their minority. If the marriage of infants is contracted by the fathers or the grandfathers, okay, the marriage is binding upon the parties, the same as if they themselves had entered into it after maturity. So the case in which the marriage of infants continues binding after puberty. So you are stuck. You are stuck. There is no out. Okay. Now, because the former, as being a woman, is deficient in judgment. Okay. And, okay, a master marry his female slave to any person. So if a master marry his female slave to any person, Okay, so he can marry, a master can marry his female slave. He can marry it to whomever he likes. So understand, but what this also implies is that slavery is legal in Islam. And and of course, Daniel Pikachu or Pikachu will be saying, well, you know, Islamic slavery is actually very, very moral. We trade slaves really well. You know, for instance, we use, we use a, a very high-tech whip made of carbon fiber, the latest technology to whip our slaves with. And, and we feel this is far more technologically awesome than, than a stick. You know, those Christians use sticks. That's Daniel Pikachu, you know, poor guy. Okay, let's continue here. Now they speak here of rule of inheritance in the marriage of infants. What? Rule of inheritance in the marriage of infants. Just so you can see that I'm not kidding about this. The rule of inheritance in the marriage of infants. I mean, look, you know, it's either you cry or you laugh. And I mean, this stuff, it's just so ridiculous. I would personally, I would prefer to punch somebody in the face, but but yeah, that's, that's, that's unfortunately something I can't do. So what do you do? What do you do in the face of this? If a girl who has been contracted in marriage by her guardians, okay, as already stated, should die before she attains maturity. So she's been contracted in marriage before she's even mature. Okay. And then they speak of, they separate this from after maturity. Understand they, 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 they clearly know that what they're dealing with is post puberty and pre-puberty if a father should contract in marriage his infant daughter or if he should contract his infant son so there finally they mention the infant son okay that does come up briefly and if the wife be an infant the bail in the like manner is approved if the wife be an infant the bail <laughs> bail <laughs> is approved if your wife is an infant <laughs> this is disgusting okay and um, then they go on to talk about <clears throat> Okay, a youth under puberty. So hold on. The woman is not lawful to her first husband until she has tasted the embrace of the other. But the condition requires only the entrance of the penis into the vagina and not the emission of seed. So in other words, if a woman is divorced and she wants to go back to her first husband, she first has to have sex with another man. However, she doesn't have to have a man. She can have a boy. As long as the boy can get it up, she can take a minor boy as long as the boy can get it up, he's got to penetrate her. He doesn't have to ejaculate. That's not required. And then she can go back to her husband. You guys know about this. This is called Muhallal. It's based on chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 230. And an irrevocable divorce. Just a comment, rubrician on it. If I divorce my wife irrevocably, so if I pronounce three pronouncements of divorce, I can't take her back. Unless she marries someone and he penetrates her. He's got to penetrate her. So are you seeing what this is saying? It's saying that even if it's an infant wife and I divorce her, I can't take her back 
unless and until someone then puts his penis in her vagina. He doesn't even have to climax. As long as the penis penetrates her vagina and then he lets her go, I can take her back. What kind of religion is this that spends a lot of its time, a lot of ink, a lot of its thought on these issues? And by yeah. the way, for those of you who follow the Bible, if you follow the Bible in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4, Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4, the true, God, the true God of Moses says, if a man divorces his wife, she marries another, and that other divorces her or dies, you better not take her back because that defiles that defiles the land, and it's an abomination to God. Yeah, no, correct. This this is a, a genuine violation of of the Mosaic law. It, it's genuine. I mean, um, just one thing that I cannot, um, yeah, um, it's just. You know, ever since watching the Boom Boom Room, I, I I can't think of it as anything other than deuteroscopy. So, oh, okay. So, a youth under puberty is the same as a full-grown man with respect to legalizing. If a man gives his wife three divorces and after her edit, marry with a youth under maturity. If a woman marries with a youth under maturity and he perform the carnal act with her. Oh, my. Oh, my. This applies to little boys, too. So, women can have sex with little boys. Or use the so she can marry the little boy, have him diddle her once, and then she can go back to her husband. So understand this is Islam. This is this is Islam. Um, any thought on that, Sam? Before I go on, because I'm nearly nearly done. Yep. Keep going. You're doing great. And then finally, a boy. So it is to be observed. It's recorded in the Jama Sagir. Okay, this is under the distinction of Malik. A boy under puberty, but who is such as to be able to perform the carnal embrace is termed a murahik. So a boy under puberty, so someone under the age of puberty, but who is able to perform the carnal embrace. In other words, he can be used for sex by the woman. He is termed a murahik. So, yeah, they mentioned that there was a discussion on boys, but later on it just became a focus on girls. But And the final one is this one. <clears throat> if a man repudiate by an irreversible divorce, a wife who is, if a man repudiate by an irreversible divorce, a wife who is under the age of puberty, but yet such an one as may admit of carnal connection, and she bring forth a child. Yes. So this is a wife who is under the age of puberty, but he doesn't rip her open and she has a child, okay? And then they speak here of, born within less than two years from the period of divorce. <clears throat> now, hold on. Born within less than the period of two years of divorce, but that is not biologically possible. So Islam embraces the weird here by, so if the woman, if the young girl, the, the prepubescent child has a child less than two years from the period of divorce, doesn't make sense. But understand, in Islam, you can have a child much later. So this is clearly not the partner, but that partner can still claim ownership of the child or some whatever the story is. And then wherefore, this infant wife is the same as a full-grown woman. And they claim here that for the purposes of divorce and other legal issues and claiming the child and dealing with pregnancy, this infant wife is the same as a full-grown woman. And they're using the word infant here. I mean, this is where I think I'll leave it, Sam. This is, this is done. So what we'll do, guys, if he has a few minutes, this was a one-time presentation. I gave you the link to his YouTube channel. It's right there. I pinned it. And you can invite him to your channels. Mohammed Faridi is already going to contact you. I sent you his email, and I gave him your contact information. He's available to come on your channels to talk on a variety of topics. So if you want to know what topics he can talk about, I gave you his YouTube channel. It's there pinned. And it's in the description box. Go there, contact him, right? So <clears throat> invite him to talk about these issues and <clears throat> support him prayerfully and financially. There are a few people that I would like to see doing full-time ministry. Sorry about the background. Thank Let you, me Sam. You I know, there's an idiot called Zahab. People with no brain read the text and not the context. As a Christian, you should understand that better. Look, Look, by the way, which, where's this dog? Is he here? So, hey, but uh, you can see his comment is just a little bit above. Look, okay. little child. So, hey, 
Here, what I'm going to do, Zahib, I'm going to see if you're more brave than Aisha when Muhammad mounted her. So, Zahib, let's see if you're more brave than Aisha, who's yeah. playing with dolls, when your dog Muhammad mounted her. Come on my stream yard. Don't bark because the Shia are looking for your mother to do muta yeah. with her. So if so, you don't come on, now look at this uh, stupid slob. He talks about don't eat pork when his dog Muhammad allowed him to eat camel meat, which was condemned by Moses. You see what kind of son of muta he is? Now, so hey, come on my stream yard so we can show you why Muhammad is a dog and he's in hell yeah. because you're justifying your pervert Muhammad molesting a minor, which means you're dangerous, you're sick, and you need to be in jail. But we know yeah. you're not a man. You're less man than Aisha. So come on. Or we're going to block you. Go ahead, brother. He's, he's half the man his mother is, probably. Yeah. Um, don't don't self The simple thing is, this is common in Islam. They have to defend this. We are talking about sex with infants. We're talking about infants in the cradle. Understand? That is what they refer to here when they say infant. Yeah. Right? It's so, so hey, why are you a defender? In Western law, in Western morals, this is a sin and this is illegal. This is pedophilia. Why? Does Islam in all of its legal texts promote and legalize pedophilia? Sex with three-month-old girls, sex with six-month-old girls, sex with two-year-old girls. Why is that legal in Islam? In all your schools of fiqh, why are your greatest scholars in the major manuals of fiqh, all of them legalize child sex? And I don't mean 12 years old. I mean two months old, three months old. So please explain to me why we should accept this. This is your law. This is the Sharia of Islam. In fact, so hey. Also, in fact, last point, the Quran has no context, buddy. Sweetie, no, the Quran has no context. The Sharia is the context. The Sharia provides all the context. The Sharia explains. Why are you calling Shafi, Malaki, Hanbal? Why are you calling them liars? Please explain. I'd love to know. In fact, Bring me the sources that say otherwise. Bring me the, the fifth sources that say different. You can find them. I'd love to see them. Now, now notice what kind of sick spiritual bastard yeah. he is. And he's a son of a Shia prostitute. He's more concerned about not eating pork when his dog, Muhammad, allowed him to eat stuff like camel meat, which is also condemned by the law of Moses. And he's not concerned about his prophet, that son of the devil is burning in hell, molesting a nine-year-old and then sanction sanctioning the molestation, the sodomization, of boys and girls, because this is the kind of garbage you're dealing with. These are mm -hmm. the jihadis, the rapists that are infiltrating your countries that need to be thrown in jail and sent back. I'm not talking about all Muslims. I don't want people to twist my words. Thank God, majority of Muslims are not like this. And we pray in Jesus' name, they don't come, come to know their sources to become like that and leave Islam. But it's this filth, these terrorists in your midst, these garbage cans, who want the opportunity to behead you and rape your women and children. They're more concerned about not eating pork than their dog Muhammad molesting a nine-year-old, sanctioning pedophilia, sodomy, and rape because they're trash. Now, Zuhay, I blocked you like Jesus blocked your prophet in hell. Glory to Jesus. Your prophet is a dog burning in hell. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. The link is here. Come on StreamYard. Defend your filth. Be more man than Aisha was when a 54-year-old pervert mounted her and sodomized her in the name of your Satan, Allah. If not, shut your mouth, go back and lick the black stone like the pagan no. you are. Now, brother, remember, go ahead. we can see here from the sources, okay, this is from Al-Tabari, right? The Last Years of the Prophet, volume 9, page 139, okay? What a bad thing you have done. You are a self-respecting woman, but the Prophet is a womanizer. Yep. Get an annulment from him. Now, where in the Bible does it state Jesus was a womanizer? You are self-respecting. Go back to Jesus and tell him you want a divorce. I mean, seriously, what are we to think of this? Right? Um, no, what a bad thing you've done. You Sorry? Pork, Sorry? He's more concerned about you eating pork. You shouldn't be eating pork. No, we need to be tolerant because there are five Christians sitting there with him. He said, you know, we need to be, we need to be respectful. What? I am not going to be respectful no, about this. Respectful. You are disgusting. Yep. This Islam is filth. I can prove it. I have proven it. Right? You cannot defend Islam. It's, don't forget, it is illegal for Muslims to discuss the Sharia. Right? And notice, <clears throat> um, there's plenty actually here. Um, 
So sad, man. Do you have so children? hold on. You know, there's there's something here. There's um. See, no, let me just find this this reference. Yeah, and as so, you find it, just let you. Yeah, not, I not found it already. Okay, go ahead. Aisha, the most beloved of Muhammad's many wives, said, "A oh, women folk, if you knew the rights that your husbands have over you, every one of you would wipe the dust from a husband's feet with her face." Okay, Aisha urged women to take good care of their husbands and to recognize the rights that their husbands had. She saw these rights as being so great and so important that a woman was barely qualified to wipe the dust from her husband's feet with her face. As she stated, oh, women folk, if you knew the rights your husbands have over you, you would wipe the dust of your husband's feet with, from your, you'd wipe, sorry, the dust from your husband's feet with That's your right. face. Yep. This is this the is respect that Islam has for women. This is Islam. Now, brethren, if he's got 15 minutes, what I wanted to do is to sum up, I gave you the link to his YouTube channel. And Mohammed Faridi is already going to be in contact with him. Invite him to your channels. Go to his channel. Subscribe. Like his videos. Support him prayerfully and financially. There are a few people that I pray the Lord will bless to have full support in ministry. Yeah. <clears throat> I pray that God will be pleased to bless me to do that because it's what yeah. I do. But <clears throat> he's one. We have... Usama Dakdok, he's another. I'd like to see him fully funded because there are a few people who are doing great damage against Islam, destroying Islam. He's one of them. I'm not saying that. If I didn't think that, he wouldn't be on my channel. Him, Adam Seeker is doing phenomenal. Al Fadi is doing phenomenal. David Wood does some great stuff. But the thing is, many of them already have churches and ministries that support them. There is a few of us that get our funding from Patreon and PayPal. I know Osama Dakdok is one of them. I'm one of them, and he's one of them. So pray and ask the Lord to bless him financially and bless his work and make it go viral. Pray for me likewise. <clears throat> May the Lord Jesus keep me humble and in love with the Lord. Now, with that said, I'll let you guys ask questions related to the yeah. topic for the next 13 minutes because it's late for him. So we'll try to wrap it up in 13 minutes. And he's going to be back weekly, God willing. He'll be back next week. So any questions on this topic, you can ask in the comment section. We got 13 minutes of Q&A. And thank you, brother, for taking time. It's late for him. He's in another part of the world. It's close to midnight, maybe even past midnight for him. And he's got a family. And he also has a job for now to provide for his family. So pray for him. So Q&A, next 13 minutes. And then we'll wrap it up, if it's okay with you. That's fine. I'm, I'm glad. No, thank you. It's it's actually fortunately a little earlier. It's... Um... Around yeah, 10, so, 30, 11, so questions, yeah. anyone? Um, yeah. But no, look, I mean, the guy just made a an ad for bacon. Now you know bacon vaccinations yeah. are very important. Vaccinate yourself, double dose of bacon every day, yeah. double bacon vaccination. Do it now. Let me let me answer real quickly. By the way, Bo, Bo Zizim, Muhammad Faridi, the one who was here, he left. I hope he didn't, but if he did, he's got a YouTube channel ministry. He's a former Shia who became Christian, so he's from the Shia sect. Lloyd was dealing primarily with Sunni sources. So if you want to say something in regards to this. It looks the same. It's pretty much the same. It's, it doesn't really differ. They, they, yep. I mean, the, the Al-Azhar, for instance, the Sunni, the major Sunni university of law, and which turns out the most highly regarded imams, they recognize the Jafari school of the Shias. They recognize them as legitimate. So yeah, they, the, 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 the Ijma is pretty much the same. See, there you it's go. It's Islam. You're not gonna you're not gonna mistake Muslims for for Buddhists anytime soon. Yeah, it's all yeah. Islam. No, no, but remember, as long as you don't eat pork, you're okay. But if you're eating pork, this doesn't matter, okay? It has nothing to do with Islam. I yeah. don't see too many questions. This one is just saying, what do you say to Muslims who still try to bob and weave past all this? Look, we, we have to talk about this. You need to undermine their lies with the facts. Tell them if this is false, show me the Sharia manuals that teach differently. And they will not be able to because there are no Sharia manuals that teach differently. They all say the same thing. It's the Ijma. So they will dodge in. Look, remember, it is compulsory. It is obligatory for Muslims to lie. It is they get reward from Allah. We can discuss the Sharia as, as we go on the channel. I can discuss that, but it is obligatory. They have entire chapters in the Sharia teaching Muslims how to lie, how to tell lies, how to lie to non-Muslims, how to lie to Muslims for that matter, how to lie to their mother, their father, their they're friends, understand? So they're going to. You need to simply stick to the gun, stick to your guns. They're going to gaslight you. Tell the truth, show the evidence, 
get it out there. Don't be afraid. Speak up. Be a rebel. And let just let the truth out there. It, it will go mainstream. It, just, people are going to learn. We know there's a problem with Islam. Now we have the evidence to back it up. So just don't be afraid. Stand your ground. Show them. Have, hold them to a standard of evidence. Don't let them dance. Tell them, stop dancing. Show me the evidence. Convince me. Yep. You'll say? How old is the Alliance of the Traveler? I'm sure it's in the book itself. It's it's an Islamic manual on... It goes back to about the 14th century, but it goes back to the 14th century. So the, the Sharia was finalized around the 16th century. I'd say early 16th century, the Sharia was basically finalized. The, the final doctrine was written and understood and then codified. So there were certain aspects that were codified in the 9th, 10th, 11th century and so on, but but it really got codified. And so, so this comes from that late period, the 1400s or 1500s, 13, 14, 1500, somewhere around there. And although this current, so so it was considered authoritative then, it's, it's authoritative now, it's been updated. They've actually added appendices with some fantastic information. It's really, really amazing reading. Um, very useful. <clears throat> so it's about 800 years old, maybe, at least 700 years old, I would say. It's, but it's codifying, understand what he's saying, he's, it's codifying older traditions. Something yeah. written down at a specific period in history doesn't mean that the laws contained therein are not older. It's simply a codification of what came before. Now, real quickly, I'll give my two cents worth. What's the difference between Shia and Sunni? Primarily, it's political in that, for the brother asking the question, Kelvin jo Joseph, the Shia, the word Shia Ali, the sect, the party of Ali, believed that Muhammad's successor should have been Ali ibn Abu Talib. Ali was Muhammad's first cousin. Their fathers were brothers, according to Islamic narrative. And Ali married Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. And she's the only child of Muhammad that outlived them, according to the Muslim sources. All of Muhammad's children, to tell you what, what a cursed Satan he was, spiritual dog in hell, he had sons that died while they were still toddlers and his daughters died before him only one daughter outlived him she died six months after him talk about an accursed demon whose family was cursed because of him fatima bint muhammad only lived six months after muhammad died she was married to ali they had two sons hassan and hussein and the shia believe that the line of succession should have remained in Muhammad's bloodline through his daughter Fatima, through her sons, Hassan and Hussein, who were the sons of Ali. The Shia believed that when Muhammad died, Ali was robbed of the right to the caliphate. They believed he should have been the khalif, the caliph. But Abu Bakr robbed him. And then when Abu Bakr died, Umar robbed him. When he died, Uthman robbed him. Then finally, Ali took succession. But then he was opposed by Muawiyah ibn Sufyan. So the caliphate became divided. And so the Shia think that these companions of Muhammad, they were actually enemies of Allah. They were not true believers. They were hypocrites. And they opposed Ali. And that's the divide between the Shia and the Sunnah, the main divide. Now, they also have some theological differences, but this is the main divide. In fact, Fatima is so important to the Shia she is elevated to the status of the Blessed Mother, Mary, just like how the Catholics and Orthodox venerate Mary as the greatest of all creatures. That's how Shia view Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. In fact, they came up with a movie just about her that caused great controversy and caused riots in the UK by Sunnis protesting the showing of that film, and they got it to be banned. And it's the name of the film is, I believe, the lady from heaven. But anyway, that's my two cents worth. Yeah, I'm just dropping a link to Reliance of the Traveler in the chat so that people can um, you know, get a copy. Um, now, by the way, do you guys understand that? Did you understand that they came up, the Shia came up with a movie about Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, saying the lady from heaven? Does that sound familiar? You see how they're aping? The titles of the Blessed Mother, the Mother of our Lord, and ascribing it to her, the Lady from Heaven. The Lady from Heaven. Wow. You understand how they are trying to usurp the Mother of our Lord, the Blessed Mother, the Theotokos Mary, with Fatima, calling her the Lady from Heaven. You see how it's working here? And then you have Our Lady of Fatima, 
where the Blessed Mother, there was an apparition of the Blessed Mother in Fatima. And why is it called Fatima? Because the Muslims called it Fatima after the daughter of Muhammad. But anyway, I don't see okay. any other questions, brother. Let me see. Can I just share my screen and show something? Yes, Sam, would it be okay? Yes. I just want to present okay. again. Let me just share my screen. Uh, my screen, this one. Okay. There you go. Um, by the way, so if we go here, this Dropbox link that I just gave you, just, just close this box that comes up. Because I know okay. some people just decline all the cookies. Close this box, and you can download here on the top left. The Reliance of the Traveler. Okay, you can download. You can read it online or just download it. Just close all the little pop-ups, and then just download it. You don't need an account on Dropbox. Please don't send me a tech support email about how to download, because honestly. Um, and then... On top of this, I need to show you something in Reliance. Uh, the Reliance of the Traveler, so the author of the compiler, shall we say, he lived or died in 1368. So it's 14th century. Okay. This guy who translated it, Nuhamim Kalar, he is a, an American convert and a Sufi, by the way. The Sufis feature heavily in the Sharia. And I also need to show you here, these are warrants. Okay. These are so, for instance, the International Institute of Islamic Thought, these guys are technically a front for the Muslim Brotherhood, right? But they are, they are based in Jeddah, I believe. And um, so, so these are very highly regarded Islamic scholars and Islamic institutions and organizations. And here we have the certification of Al-Azhar, and I'm going to just show you, Muslims will try to claim the book is not valid. And I'm going to the certification of Al-Azhar here. Al-Azhar is the most important Islamic seminary in the world, right? Islamic seminary, which turns out imams. And you may remember when Barack Obama did his first international visit, he went to Egypt, he went to Cairo, he went to Al-Azhar, and he gave his talk there. Because it is that important. This is from Al-Azhar Islamic Research Academy, okay? And it states here, we certify that the above-mentioned translation, okay, corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. The Al Sunnah Al Jama, there is no objection to printing it and circulating it. There are several warrants in the book, several. This is just one of them. But Al Azhar has confirmed, this is on 11 February 1991, that this book is authentic Islamic jurisprudence, Sunni Islamic, not Shia, sorry, not Shafi jurisprudence, right. Sunni jurisprudence understand this yeah. book conforms brethren that's it for questions so let me repeat you have my full authorization you can take all my sessions upload them translate them clip them but freely disseminate because i didn't charge you secondly go to his youtube channel the link is in the description box and i just pinned the link to the pdf file for this islamic jurisprudence manual reliance of the traveler go to his youtube channel subscribe Support him by whatever means you're able to. Thank you. Contact to him. Invite him to your channels because we need to get him to go on a host of channels. And glory to God, he does. He's been on Adam Seeker. He's been with Reason Answers and others. And we pray God will open more doors for him and pray for his safety protection. Pray for him to prosper and glorify the Lord. Pray the same for me. And Lord willing, he'll be back next week on another topic. He'll let me know. But it's what I want you to do. Go to his YouTube channel, subscribe, support him prayerfully, financially, and take the materials on my channel and upload them. That's yours. You don't need to ask me as long as you don't charge. I didn't charge you. You don't charge. And bless the brother's heart. He doesn't ask me for a speaker's fee. Let me tell you how it works. Let me wrap it up with this, and I'll give him the final word. There are people who will ask fees to speak. And I know some people who don't even have a scintilla of the knowledge this brother has, or Sama Doktok, or Christian Prince, or Adam Seeker, or even, and I'm not trying to boast, myself when it comes to the Bible, that will char charge enormous fees to speak. And there are some who require you have at least 1,000 subscribers before they come on your channel. I'm not lying. <laughs> Be honest. I know one in particular, I don't want to mention his name. He told the person, unless you have 1,000 subscribers, I won't come on your channel to speak. you got to have at least 1,000. And I know people who demand anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000 to come to your church and speak. People who are famous, I don't want to give their names out because people are going to think. Wow. That Yeah, I'm not lying. If, if I tell you who they are, 
brother, if I tell you that, you're going to be shocked. I don't want to because people are going to think, see, you're jealous, you're envious, and you're slandering Christians. Man. People, no big, names, big names, who charge $5,000 to $10,000. That's why they only speak in mega churches. This brother has never asked me for a penny, and I'm glad he doesn't because I'm in full-time ministry, so I don't make much. In fact, this brother, he didn't <clears throat> tell me to say this. When I was in need last week, he sent me a small gift to help me in my situation because I had a situation last week. He actually sent me a financial gift. God bless his heart. May the Lord help me not to be greedy and also be generous. But guys, I'm in full-time ministry. If I was a millionaire, I'd be financing him. I'd be financing Usama Dakdo. So this is how gracious this brother is. He takes time, doesn't ask for a speaker's fee. But remember, the labor is worthy of his wages. So you can bless him. Not just by praying. And by the way, you know how ministries are funded? People think, man, I got to give huge amounts. No. Ministries are funded when you have a large number of people giving small amounts. So if you have 100 people giving $20, and if you have 50 people giving, let's say, $50, and you have 200 people giving $10, that's how we're funded. Large numbers of people giving regularly small amounts, not a person who gives a one-time, you know, Big amount. That's a blessing too, but that's how ministries stay supported. And I thank the Lord Jesus for you who su support me, Patreon, PayPal. Because of your amount, no amount is too small. I'm able to do ministry. So let's pray for him and Usama Dakdok as well. And final plug, Jeet Kundo Apologetics. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. Like the archive, he makes clips out of my sessions. Small clips, so support this brother. Now, brother, any final words and we're wrapping up? I oh, know. Thank you. I was... <laughs> I wasn't aware that people charge that kind of money or even charge. For, for I, tell you I can understand if you have to fly somewhere, you have to travel. I no. can understand that. But, but, um, I, you can't know. I wish I could tell you the names. You'll be disgusted. Yeah. They're big names, they're influential, but I can't. Because I mean, if, if I had to fly somewhere and stay overnight, I mean, fine, I can understand my costs and maybe, but, but uh, yeah. wow, you know. No, um, that, wait, let me just make one more comment. No. If a person says, pay for my traveling expenses, my airplane and hotel, that's the least you can do, right? So that's not a problem. If I say, hey, brother, can you get me a plane ticket and put me up? Because that will help me. That's the least you can do. I'm not saying that. When you say 5,000, 10,000, come on, man. But go ahead, brother. I didn't mean, I just wanted to be clear on that. Right. Yeah, no. So I'm very surprised. Yeah, look, I, um, yeah, I have limited time now. I mean, I was part-time employed for a long time, and I only recently found full-time employment so um, you know it's just recently that i've now started and yeah so so i'm i'm, I'm really you know things have changed for me fortunately but for, for those who've been supportive i thank you because i couldn't have done it i mean the, the, this like this microphone i have because my last one was old it was break it was breaking and dying and i was able to buy one because i was given donations to to the camera that i have you know the People have supported me. The software that I have that allows me to do the research, I could not do this without the specialized software. Every year I've got to pay for licenses, right? So the editing. So without the support that I've had, and I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you. The reason I can do this is because I've been given the resources and I got better because I was able to buy the licenses and the research services and so on. That It, it all costs money. I mean, it really does. Tell you me know. about it. So, um, you know, you've got to buy access to this website to get data. You've got to buy books. You have to pay for software. You, It, it adds up. But thank you. You guys have been really kind and generous, and I'm grateful for that. I couldn't do it. And Sam, thank you for the support. Uh, please support Sam too then. Because, yeah, brother, um, I want to be used of God to help you go viral. You and Osama, Dr. because I know you and Osama are not fully funded, and Osama really struggles, Osama Dr. So I want to do my part to show my love for the Lord and your gifts because we're well, look, one Well, I mean, if you're struggling, then help him first. You know, I finally found a, a full-time job. So, you know, that's great. You know, so so help him first. But, I mean, I do appreciate all the support I've had and it's been fantastic. Amen. Thank you. I, I do try to use the money wisely. I love and, you. Um, and then on top of that, please use this information. You can really repay me by learning this information, using this information. Yeah. Glory to God. Please do. I mean, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. I didn't go, no, please go on. And like I said, please do. I know many of you struggling. You know what's amazing? The people who support my ministry are people who are not financially well off. And yet their love for the Lord, they give what they can. And I appreciate you. I may not tell you enough because I can't reach out to every one of you. God is your reward. May the Lord bless you because you don't need me. The Lord doesn't need me, but the Lord's pleased to work through me. And I appreciate you. 
it's amazing. It's the people who don't have much. They're the ones who support. But the ones who have a lot, they're the ones who are more greedy. May it not be that way. So I thank you. If it wasn't for the support, I couldn't do it. Now, pray I maintain it because if I lose it, that's going to be rough. And if I start losing it, I may have to step away. But that's OK. At the end of the day, the Lord is pleased to work through us. He doesn't need us. And I'm thankful and I don't take it for granted. Pray for the brother. Go to his YouTube channel. Invite him and make his videos go viral and consider supporting him. Now, thank God he's got a job right now. May it come to the point he doesn't need to work. He can devote himself full time to ministry. And think about your brother Usama Dakdok because the only work he does yeah. is ministry. And I've even had, I have even seen him having to take painting jobs to make ends meet. Painting. Well, to yeah. Make so ends please meet. help him first, you know. Um, so you know. So yeah, look, pl please help him. And uh, yeah, I mean, look, few people want to take up this fight. Few people have the courage yeah. to take up this fight against Islam. To, to, to be. I mean, it's a difficult thing to do. So, so support those people who are doing it. And Osama Daktok is unique. Adam Sika is unique. Yeah, yes. You know, our Sam Shamoon, the Assyrian Encyclopedia, is unique in what he does. We, we cannot replace them because they, they have knowledge and skill that is just remarkable. Right? They have a special gift and they're willing to, to dig out there. Sam has, I know Sam has had challenges and yet he still gets up every day and he fights the fight. And, and that is remarkable so, so support him only thing i wish lloyd i had was your fighting skills because i get physically threatened and to be honest i haven't trained to fight i gave that up when i was 10 i regret it i wish i could be able to defend myself physically that's the only thing i get you know what we will yeah. talk maybe i can arrange one or two lessons for you well i hope so i would like to learn just to protect my life if i get attacked because just real quick we're gonna end here i was at a walmart locally just to tell you youtube i didn't know that YouTube would make us this famous. And it's not about fame. I'm not looking for fame. I walked in a Walmart three weeks ago, brethren. Two tall Muslim men, two tall. They were like six foot two, working at the Walmart in my area. They kept looking at me. They go, wait, you're Sam Shamoon, Shamoonian, right? I go, yeah. You're on YouTube, aren't you? I go, yeah. And you've also worked with David Wood, right? Yeah. And I go, what are you? you? Go, we're Muslims. I go, and yeah, we watch you, and you challenge us to think about our faith. But all right, I hope that you keep watching me, and then maybe you'll see where the truth lie. That's how easily recognizable we are. And another story: I was at on my cheat day. I go to a buffet. Thank God this man was a Christian, Lloyd. I don't want to bore you with this, but because I know you got to go. That's fine. The dude was a huge Samoan. I oh, could wow. tell he's Samoan. He was six foot four, over 300 pounds, and it wasn't just fat. He kept looking at me, and I said, oh, Lord Jesus, please save me, because if this man attacks me, I better be able to run. He looked at me. He was shaking. I'm not lying. I go, can I help you? He goes, you're Sam Shimon. I go, okay. He goes, brother, I'm a Christian, and I pray Jesus for you in my heart. I go, thank the Lord. I hugged him. I said, thank you. I say, brother, I need you to be a bodyguard. I, I started hugging him. Wow. So our life is in danger. It takes the wrong Muslim recognition. Look, me. I mean, Sam, Islam is a religion of peace. Yes, you shouldn't have to worry about this. We all know Islam's religion of peace. No, it's a peace. See, you're, you hypocrite. You hate Islam. Look, you know Islam's just so you know, people, just so you know, I actually do. I actually am careful. When I'm out in public, it may not seem like it. I actually am very careful. I mean, the yeah. skills I developed through my career in the past, but thank God but for your I'm skills. well aware of what could happen. So. Oh, by the way, did you hear the latest report? I, I don't have the link. I'll share it in the next stream because I'm streaming with William. Did you know they arrested a man in the UK who was plotting to murder Hatun Tash and her crew at Speaker's Corner? He was plotting to go there, guns a-blazing, uh, shoot them, murder them by shooting them dead he got arrested it's it's just right now the news just broke he got arrested in the uk a young 21 year old muslim who got arrested i'm going to find the link later and share it with you he had bought guns and he was planning to go to speaker's corner gun down hatun tash and her crew murder them in the name of allah and his messenger i was just reading it last night i just don't have the link so, brethren, our lives are being threatened, but our lives in the hands of Jesus. So pray that we don't get afraid and walk boldly because Jesus is worthy. So with that yeah, said, brethren, with... 
I agree with Tom. Carry your nine believing in church. Next time, next week, shall we do atheism, Sam? Yes. The religion of atheism yes. and annoy yes. some atheists. Yes. And by the way, send me a thumbnail, though, because when you don't send me, I think you're. I will send you a thumbnail. So we will talk about the founding of atheism. It is going to be. Let's Glory just say atheists have a lot to hide, and we'll find out exactly why. Glory to God. So next week, God willing, we're <laughs> going to be doing it Wednesday, God willing. That's the day, right? Wednesday. No, Thursday. I'm Thursday. sorry. Thursday. Thursday's day. Thursday, Lord willing, atheism being destroyed and showing its satanic roots. Th Lord willing. So mark it down yeah. Thursday in Jesus' name. So God bless you, brother. God bless all of you. See you in the next stream in a few hours. Christ is risen, risen indeed. God bless everyone. Thank you.